nutrient management specialist at the Orleans County Conservation District. Um, the state's clean water program is funding this workshop today, um, but if you would like to donate a little something to the Conservation District, we have a basket at the door, um, because this workshop is free of charge, as you know. Um, the bathrooms are in this corner, there's two of them. Um, there is, uh, the American Legion has been really nice to let us use this space. There's actually bingo happening after this, um, and apparently they start to arrive early. So <laughs> we need to be out of this space by 4.30. Um, so unfortunately, we, there won't be a whole lot of time for networking in this particular workshop. It's pretty information heavy. Um, and we know that, and, and we know that that's also something that you're probably interested in. Um, so potentially, maybe if you wanted to meet up afterwards or hang out in the parking lot, that would be all right. Um, but mostly we're just going to be moving through some presentations here. Um, surveys, hopefully you snagged a survey on your way in. Um, this is a requirement of the money that is funding the workshop for us to survey participants. So um, if you can fill those out once the workshop is done and put them in a box um, on the table right here as you leave, that'd be great. Um, if you'd like water quality education hours for um, attending this workshop, there's a sign-in sheet at the door for that, for the agency of agriculture. Um, there is an information table at the back. A lot of you already um, looked at that. Um, there aren't a lot of copies of everything. I had a hard time printing all those that paper. Um, so if you're, in, if you're here with a group, it would be great if you could just take one for your group or um, just take the things that you're really interested in. Um, okay. And so the Conservation District, the mission of the Conservation Districts is to coordinate resources locally to support conservation land use practices. And we do this primarily by providing landowners and ag producers with technical, financial, and educational assistance for working with state and federal cost share programs, um, as well as private sources of funding. Um, our current focus is nutrient management planning and water quality. Um, we actually are not hemp experts. <laughs> we sort of saw this need for a, for a workshop on soil and water quality as it related to growing hemp. Um, so we, this workshop is an attempt to fill that need that we saw. Um, so we'll have a couple presenters in the beginning talking about soil and water quality and then things specific to growing hemp. Um, and then we also included some things about marketing and a farmer panel and some other things to sort of round out the workshop. Um, but that's sort of the angle that we're coming at this from. Um, yeah. uh, we have an upcoming workshop on precision agriculture in a couple of weeks. Um, that's on Tuesday, April 30th in Irisburg from 10 to 2. Um, and RSVPs are required for that one as well. So since the workshop is funded by the state's clean water program, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the required agricultural practices and how they apply to growing hemp. Um, they still do apply. <laughs> Um, even though the acreages of hemp um, are likely smaller than anything corn silage or hay, for those of you who are dairy producers, um, it's still important to grow the crop with water and soil quality in mind. Um, so compliance with the RAPs is required if a person is pairing, tilling, fertilizing, planting, irrigating, and harvesting crops for sale on a farm that's four contiguous acres in size or more. Um, so that's one standard. Or if you're selling an agricultural product that makes more than $2,000 in an average year. So um, if either of those conditions is met, it's required to follow the required agricultural practices. Um, and for that class of farm, that's called a small farm, not a certified small farm. Um, and Stephanie will talk a little bit about registering with the um, agency later, but um, all small farms have to engage in nutrient management, which basically means that you have to take a soil sample every five years and have those tests on hand. You have to have five years of um, records, so manure or other waste application or fertilizer application on hand. And you're supposed to use soil tests um, to determine nutrient needs um, for all fields and crops. All small farms must also manage for soil health. So in reality, that means reducing tillage as much as possible, um, adopting practices that retain soil by preventing erosion, um, and cover crops on fields that are prone to flooding when practical. Um, all, sm all small farms have to comply with manure, compost, and other nutrient application spreading ban, and that's from December 15th to April 1st. And then beyond those dates, you're also not supposed to spread on land um, or when field conditions are conducive to flooding, runoff, ponding, 
saturated, frozen, or snow water ground. Um, and then all small farms have to maintain vegetative buffer zones that are not spread with nutrients. So that's 25 feet from cropland to surface waters and 10 feet from cropland to ditches. Um, so those are required of small farms as well. Um, there's also a number of other requirements, but those are kind of like the highlights. Um, there's an info sheet on the back on the back table um, written by some vegetable folks at UVM Extension that sort of um, outline the rules that I just talked about a little bit briefly. Um, and I think that's about it for me. So our first presenter is Nick Kamersi. He's from uh, the Natural Resources Conservation District in St. Johnsbury. He's going to talk a little bit about soil and water quality as it relates to our home. Thanks, Emily. So if you can hear me, just you know, shout out. I'm going to hold questions till the end, um, so I can through things. And uh, if you have questions, or we can talk later. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so again, as Emily said, I'm Nick Mercy. I work for the uh, USDA, so Federal Department of Agriculture, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, we originally established as a soil conservation service agency uh, when the Dust Bowl hit. So our mission has always been helping farmers to not only protect their soil from erosion, but rebuild it and reestablish it for food security reasons, obviously. So uh, I'm going to be talking to Emily or pointing Emily for slide changes. If you have a so I had some questions for you guys. So. Just raise your hands to these. Who's growing hemp for CBD? Anybody in here for fiber or seeds? Okay. And let's go through how many acres? One acre or less? About one to five. And over five, five. Okay. All right. Gives me a, anyone over 20. The dairy farmers to back. Okay, who's planting into existing annually tilled fields, such as a cornfield? How many of you? Probably dairy farmers, yeah. Okay. And how many are going into a hay field, a new hay field? First year. Okay. Okay, who's planning to use plastic mulch for their bed? Okay. And along with that irrigation, I'm guessing. Okay, so I just, again, I'm not a hemp expert. Soil and water conservation is my background. But I did pick this up from someone, some research or some comment actually from a farmer. And the first thing most first time hemp growers would tell you that it's more work than they had expected. So we highly recommend starting small before planting multiple acres. Just something to throw out there. So I kind of came up with uh, motto for my talk and I said it may be called we but it's being grown as a crop so kind of what I'm getting at is that it's not going to grow itself even though a lot of weeds do so it's going to take some effort especially if it's an annually tilled piece of land so I'm going to kind of focus on that with my talk about protecting soil from erosion um, so I have to say I've been doing this for 30 years in both the Northeast Kingdom and North Country of New Hampshire, and I've never seen such excitement over a crop. We've been getting phone calls, we're getting people talking about it all the time. So I, I think there's some people in the audience here that are my age. Back in the 70s, if you went to a concert, they would show a movie called Reaper Madness. So you can click, and I, I'm kind of calling this experience CBD Madness. <laughs> we're getting a lot of interest in it. So how many people, this is what you're expecting, right? This is what you're shooting for if you're using plastic mulch, certainly. How are the next slide? Something like that looks pretty nice. Anyone expecting something like this? Or something like this? Especially after tomorrow, we might be seeing this. Or worst case, something like that. So you gotta have to look at soil erosion. So this is from the Soil and Water Conservation uh, Society, one of their uh, taglines is sustainable land and water management is essential to continue securing the earth and its people. It just stands to reason. We can't live without good soil to grow our food or clean water to, to drink and grow. So we're trying to protect the soil from erosion, benefit soil health, 
and protect water quality. So let's talk about soils. How many of you know what soil type you have on your field? A few of you. How many know where to find that information? A few of you. Well, we'll go through that. How about walking your fields? How many know the slopes of your fields? Okay, that's good. Depth to bedrock, depth to water table. There's a lot to think about. Whether it's stony, you're going to know that pretty quick. If it is, it has stones in it. Rocky is exposed bedrock. So all that information is on the soil fact sheet, which NRCS, we spent years uh, mapping soils, our soil science division. Um, so that's all available, all the soils in the country have been mapped. And you can get that, we'll go through that later, how to get it. Um, so Emily mentioned who's done soil testing, the actual chemical analysis. It's required by the RIPs if you're applying nutrients, so a good idea to do it. I'm sure Heather's gonna talk more about it. Okay, we talked about tillage methods. If you're using plastic mulch, again, you're gonna to have to probably use a plastic bed layer, plastic mulch bed layer. So it needs a good fine seed bed to make that equipment work properly. And you don't really wanna be doing it on steep slopes unless you're prepared to deal with the equipment. Okay, if you plan for five to six row spacings in between your crop, what are you gonna cover your crop with in between there or your, your bare soil? You have your crops in the row, they might be covered with plastic. But if you have bare soil in between, you got problems for erosion. You also have problems if the plant lodges or goes over, it's going to get dirty, which I don't think they want dirt in the bugs. Okay, so again, these are all things that we basically consider as basic conservation practices. If you're plowing up the field and they're planting an annually till crop, like corn, we always used to deal with corn and soybean, you're not going to go where you're trying. Try not to go up and down the slopes, because what's going to happen? That's going to wash, okay? Long slopes, long moderate slopes are actually your worst enemy. And we'll talk about how soil moves and erodes. Um, but again, those type of practices you could do, try to follow the contour when you're planting your beds. Try to use cover crops, mulch, anything to cover the soil, okay? One thing we'll talk about a little later is if you do participate with USDA, any of our programs, we do have some restrictions. And there's a highly erodible land determination that gets done on your fields. And if your fields are highly erodible, which most in Vermont are, because of slopes um, and soil types, then you do need to have a plan in place to protect that soil. Again, cover crops, rotations, mulch. We'll talk about some of those. So that's if you're participating with our programs. So, water erosion, I mentioned the Dust Bowl. In this part of the world, we don't have wind erosion. That was caused by wind erosion and bare soil. But here, we certainly have water erosion. We call it sheet rill erosion. So I had this fax, I think it was prevented, presented by UVM at the drainage conference. In the last 100 years, the Northeast Kingdom has seen an increase of nine inches more rainfall. And the large events are the most common, or more common. And again, we've seen that. So what happens when you get a rain event, especially this time of year? You have bare soil, raindrops falling on exposed soil. It's like a, a, a bolt coming down. It's going to dislodge those soil particles. And when you start having that happen seriously, uh, it's going to start moving those soil particles. They all start jiggling. And if they're on a slope, they're going to start moving down the slope. So again, that's sheet rill erosion. You start getting the soil moving in a sheet. And then as it builds up speed, it's going to find rills, find the easier channel. And as those rills be build speed, and you still have rain, you're going to have gullies form. And that was at the edge of that cornfield. Uh, so again, the soils here play an important part, but the other thing that plays an important part is having something covering that soil. So when that energy from the raindrop hits it, it's not hitting the bare soil. It's hitting something to break up that energy. So along those, part, along those lines, uh, soil particles. So when I do this presentation with kids, I usually have a basketball. I don't do hemp to them. It's more about soils. <laughs> so, but the sand, silk, and clay, I tell them it's the mineral part of the soil. And if you want a representation, sand is the size of a basketball particle. Silt is the size of a golf ball or ping pong ball. And clay particle is the size of the head of a pin. So those are just the difference in sizes of the particles. 
And again, their deposition in this part of the world is pretty much dictated by glaciers. So when you start reading information about soils, you're going to see glacial till, glacial lacustrine, which means that the soils were laid down, mixed up by the glacier, or there was a glacial lake and the particles settled out, like clay particles. If there's a lake, they would settle out. It takes a long time for them to settle out. You don't have a lot of clay in this area, except for associated with the lakes and what was Lake Hitchcock in the Connecticut Valley. Uh, but certainly Lake Champlain has a lot of clay, more clay than we do. So what, why is this important? Sand, silt, and clay has different cohesion rates and also determines the detachment that the soil particles are going to have. So easily detached particles. Silt is the most erodible and high runoff potential. That stinks for us because we have a lot of silts in it, a lot of our soils. Okay? Uh, clays have low erodibility. They can resist detachment. But again, this is in a situation where it's a normal field condition. We get into saturated soil conditions in a minute. Sand is interesting. It is easily detachable, but it's such a large particle, think basketball, that it's going to stay put for a long period of time. But if it does get saturated, it can move. Okay. So how do we measure this? You're going to see on the soil fact sheet something called the K factor. It's just a measurement of um, how erodible those soils are under soil, uh, standard plot condition, or under field conditions. So I don't want to bog down on this, but the things to keep in mind. The higher the K, the more susceptible the soil is to sheet and rill erosion by water. So silts have high 0.25 to 0.4. Clays and sands are lower, OK? So when you look at the soil fact sheet, that'll jump out at us. So one thing I put in here, this is important. Although the K factor was a representation of the soil in its natural condition, management, poor management or misuse of the soil by intensive cropping can increase soil's erodibility. Yeah, it just goes, stands to reason, right? Okay. So saturated soils, and we probably have some saturated soils after this weekend. Okay. Here you got to think of infiltration rate as playing a role. So where you have high infiltration rate, in other words, the water can move quickly through the, the soil, you're going to have low runoff potential. So sands, think of those basketballs. If you stack this room with basketballs, there's big spaces between them, right? So the water is going to move quicker through them. So sands are good for high infiltration rate, low runoff, when saturated. Moderate is your silts and fine textured soils. The one thing here about slow infiltration rate, they have a high runoff potential, but the thing you want to key into is that it has a layer that impedes the downward movement of water, or they have a high water table. We have a lot of soils in this area that have that. The glacier was sitting here. It compacted a layer, it's probably the silt layer, so that may be down maybe six inches or so, but as the water starts moving through that, it hits that compacted layer, <coughs> and it's not going to leave. May move laterally underneath the ground, but it's going to be sitting there. Okay, so that can cause high runoff potential when you get a large rain event and the soils are saturated. Okay, quickly I don't want to again get bogged down in this, but soils are grouped to, to represent that. They're grouped into hydrologic soil groups. So A and B are pretty good because they have the high infiltration rate, so you don't get too hair up about that. C and D is where you have the problems. Right, slow infiltration rate because of the soil particles. Uh, the downward movement, it's fine textured. Okay, slow rate of water transmission. D is the one that has that uh, high water table or the layer that's going to impede the water movement. It also could be shallow to bedrock, another thing that's going to cause it to fall into the D category. So again, when you look at the soil sheets, and we'll go through that right now. How do you get the soil sheets or the soil information? We have a wet soil survey, which is a great tool. It's a little cumbersome. There's a lot of information there. But you can go on the website, you can define an area of interest, and then you can print out soil maps, interpretations, all sorts of stuff. It's great if you have the time and can you know, kind of work through and use it, you know how to use it. There's another thing that Vermont put out, which is kind of nice. Some of you might have seen this. It's got a lot of good information on it. It's the Natural Resources Outlet, Atlas through the AR website. And here you can see, you can go on and zoom into your area, click on the soils button, you gotta go through the layers, the on the left-hand uh, left side. You can pick soils, 
and it'll bring in the soil layer. That's our official soil layer. So that was generated by us. Then you see those numbers, right? 14D, 16D. That's the soil type and the, the slope. The letter refers to the slope. A is flat, D is steep, E is even steeper. <coughs> so, again, if you click on that number, it'll actually bring up a way that you can print the soil fact sheet. So you go in and see your field, you click on that number, it'll bring up our fact sheet. So, next one. Here's a fact sheet. What's it telling you? It's got the name, 6A, Adams, Lonely, Sand. So there you have sand and loam, that's a big thing, right? The A, 0 to 3% slope. It also gives you what it is, outwash, glacial outwash. So that's why that sand is there, because those large particles just got washed down. Okay? Some things we talked about, there's a lot on here. The texture is there, loamy sand, sand. Again, it goes down through the profile. All these soils are built on a soil, what they call a profile and a pedon. So there's, there's actually a beach and soil, there's a tumbridge soil. You can find out where that typical soil is. It's in tumbridge. You can go there to the exact location, and if you dig a hole, you know that that's what the soil is that they're describing for what your land is supposed to be. So again, it's a name they assign to it, but there's something behind that name. It's the location and what you're seeing in the soil profile. But we talked about hydrologic soil group. This is A, it's good. Why? It's same. Infiltration rate is correct. K factor, 0.15, it's low. All right? Silts are the ones that are high. More important information too, drainage class, somewhat excessively drained, that's good. In some cases, might not be. Hydric soil is important. If you're dealing with wetlands, you want to know about that. No, that's good. Depth to bedrock, it has nothing there, so it's very deep. They haven't put it. The other thing, it gives you some yield data. Hemp is not on there yet. <laughs> but it gives you some yield data under good conditions, good management. Okay, let's look at another one quick. Lemoyne, silk loam. There you go, we moved into the silts. What do we notice? The hydrologic soil group goes up CD. Not good. The K factor is way up there, 0.28. Why? Well, it's somewhat poorly drained. It's still not a hydric soil. It's just those soil particles. Uh, Lake Plains, okay. So, glacial or custard deposits. Again, those silts that settle down. Some of the plays probably do too, as that water was sitting there. Next one real quick. Here's a typical one for here. Cabin silt loam. Silt in there. The note is very stony. That means surface stone. This is probably was not a cleared area or it took a lot of work to clear up in the pasture. Natural drainage class is poorly drained. Not good. That throws the hydrologic soil loop in a D. Because again, it's hitting that restrictive layer. Cabin has a restrictive layer. It talks about it depth to seasonal high water table. 0 to 18 inches. That means it's hitting that compacted layer. Okay? 0.4, that's 0.49, that's not a good K. The big thing here is it's a hydric soil. So if you wanted to drain that soil or do something to, to manipulate that, you want to be cautious of the Vermont State Wetland Rules. Okay? It doesn't indicate a wetland at that point, but it's a good red flag that it could be. Okay, move on. Okay, so we talked about soils. Let's just briefly run through water. Again, crop requirements. Are you irrigating or not? It's up to you guys. Water source, your well. Okay, what's the capacity and pressure of your well? Can it maintain the system that you need? There is some resources, Brookdale down in, is Brookdale a field? Yeah. Down in southern New Hampshire is designing a lot of irrigation systems for folks. They've been doing it for vegetable farms. Good resource. They spoke at some of these conferences. Okay. You want, to, you want to check into that and see if it will support your system. Pond development. Okay. Here's, I've heard talk that a lot of people want to build ponds. Number one, there's rules. The state has more stringent rules than we do, but there are rules about just digging the pond. The other thing is you don't want to dig a pond that's not going to hold water. And I've seen that quite a bit in my career. So you want to do your research on it. Um, Wetland, Vermont wetland rules will probably definitely apply, especially if you're in the hydric soil area. The other thing you do not want to do is put this pond in a channel of a brook or a stream. Because you're asking for trouble from the state and from your neighbors if you flood them or have a disaster. So they, they basically say you can't do that. 
and there's good reason for it. It doesn't make sense, right? You have a storm event. If you didn't design that pond properly, it's going to overtop. It's going to wash out. If you didn't build the berm correctly, it's going to undermine and blow that out. Your neighbors, your, your fields, your whatever. Just not a good thing to do. We do have swamp buster rules. So if you want to drain a field and you're participating with us, you do have to be careful. Some rules, we do have to come out and look at it. Ponds, you're not converting an area so that you can grow a commodity crop. That's what triggers our interest. So because you're building a pond to hold water, you're not going to grow a crop in a pond, so we don't care. But if you're doing subsurface drainage or surface drainage, we do care if you're participating with us. Okay? Stream and river withdrawal. There is a procedure. If you want to pull out of a stream or a brook, go to the next slide. Okay, building an irrigation pond. State of Vermont, that's the website for the A&R and the Wetlands Bureau. You can use your soil data that you can pull there. If it's high, you know, you know the red flag. If it's not, you got to like to stay. I would check with them still. Okay, next. So water withdrawal from Vermont rivers and streams. I talked to Patrick Ross. He is the stream, bank, uh, the stream alteration engineer for this area. That's their map. It's on the web. There's different people for different areas. His comment when I said people want to pull water out to irrigate, what do they need to be concerned about? He said if they're using a one inch pipe or less, it's typically okay. If you're going over one inch, you better check with them. Okay, depending, depending on where you are. So what he has suggested doing, and I'll show you a tool to do it next, but you provide a map with the plant water withdrawal and what you plan to pull out. If you had a worse you know, if you had a drought and you needed to pull water out of there, what was your plan? times, size of pipe, the information that the irrigation person would provide you. If you're fertigating, in other words, have a bucket of fertilizer that's in the system for your irrigation, you better make sure it has an anti-siphon control so you don't end up with the bucket of fertilizer in the brook. And again, no in-channel ponds. You don't want to put anything in the channel. And the stream alteration guy's going to, not only the weapons, but he's going to tell you that too. Okay, next slide. So how can you determine some information to fact Patrick Ross if you want to pull out of the river? <coughs> this is stream stats by the USGS service. You pull this up on the web. It has all the brooks, or most of them. Some small ones may not be on there. But, and what you can do is you can go and get your cursor and put a pin. You say delineate and you put a spot. So let's say you're down at this field and you want to pull water out of there. You just put a pot spot there. And you say delineate it, and it'll draw the watershed out for you. It'll give you the lat latitude and longitude that you need for Patrick Ross. He'd appreciate that. But the other thing, it'll draw the watershed. And you could actually print that map and provide it to him and say, this is where I want to pull water out of. Because that watershed dictates a lot of what he's going to look at to say what he can pull out of there. Okay, obviously, a large watershed with a large brook or a large stream, you can probably pull more water out of it. So again, another tool you might want to key into. All right. Okay, so NRCS, what do we do? Uh, we, again, assist farmers in conservation practices, both technical, so we can go out and provide some technical advice. We also have financial assistance programs where you can sign up and uh, get help on some practices that I'll go over in a minute. So the new farm bill allows hemp production for flour, fiber, and seed. Okay? Not the leaves. <laughs> so, you, if one thing, so CBD would certainly qualify. A producer who's engaged in industrial hemp production has to be registered with the agency Ag and Food in Vermont. That's a requirement for us. So, if you want to sign up and get assistance, financial assistance, technical assistance from us, we'd like to see that you went on the website. I think someone's going to talk about that. So you want to do that, make sure. So what do you do to apply? Basically, you come in. The easiest thing is to talk to us. Come in. We have to get you eligible. If you're not already participating with USDA, we have to outline your farm and track and assign you a farm and track number. We work with Farm Service Agency. Heather's here. Um, we work with, we both work together to get that in the system. Um, it's just a way that we keep track of what practices we're doing out there. <coughs> Then there's a simple application that you can go through, and it usually what we follow it up with is a farm visit. Okay? 
our applications, we have a funding cycle. You can apply any time, but we have a funding cycle. So right now we're at the end of our funding cycle because our fiscal year starts in October. So we <coughs> divvy out the money over the winter. Um, but there is, depending on the ranking and what the resource concerns are on the property, has some uh, play into whether you get financial help or not. If you're not competing, you're competing in cropland, so with other people growing crops, you wouldn't be competing necessarily with people that want to build manure pits. But there's more money in the manure pit <coughs> pool of money than there is in cropland. But again, it's, it's a system, boring with the details, but... And again, we, we develop a conservation plan for you to protect the soil. It could be an HEL plan if you participate with us, if it needs it, but it could also just be some technical advice. And if it is an HEL plan, then basically you're, you're eligible to participate with us if you agree to that. Um, so let's move on. Some of the practices we can do. So again, we've mostly dealt with crop farmers, corn and soybean. Um, cover crop is a grass lady before planted for seasonal veg vegetative cover. So again, it's, it's an annual. <coughs> You know, annual rye, winter rye is what we've been most working with farmers on to cover the fields in the, in the fall. So I just made a comment here, organic matter reduces erodibility because it reduces the susceptibility of the soil to detachment and it increases infiltration, which we all just talked about, right? So it's good to have that growing. The other thing it does is a raindrop coming down is going to hit that living plant and it's not going to hit the bare soil. Someone else told me, okay, conservation <laughs> okay. No, go ahead. <laughs> conservation cover is similar, but it's a per permanent vegetative cover. So you can see this is a vineyard, I couldn't find any hemp fields. But again, that's a permanent grass that you would mow. If you're doing that in hemp, you want to, you know, either way, you're probably going to want to know the distance, and Heather will probably talk about this, for equipment, if you have to mow it, you want it space so you can get equipment in there easily. Um, So, yeah, protecting the soil, it's covering it. It uh, could be adding nutrients if it's a nitrogen fixing type of uh, plant. Okay, next. High tongue systems. This has gotten a lot of interest from a lot of people since we've been doing them for vegetable growers. So, it is a greenhouse, uh, plastic covered or polycarbonate, but it is a Gothic style tunnel. So, in other words, the hoops don't bend from the ground. They come up and then they bend. It's not a caterpillar. So it's more permanent structure, it sheds snow. So we can do these. Um, the caveat with it is that the plant has to be in the ground. You're supposed to be growing a crop in the ground in these to help you extend the growing season and protect it. <coughs> it's not a propagation house, so you can't put benches in here and grow and sell stuff in pots like you see at home. Nurseries around here, but it is something that we can do. Uh, paying great helps to pay for some of the cost of buying it and installing it. Mulching, another one that would apply to hemp. We can do plastic. Okay. Um, I'd like to encourage the biodegradable. There's a true biodegradable now, not just the plastic that makes it. Yeah. There is a true bio biodegradable. Gary, better? No, no. that'll work. Have to use your All right, I'll just yell. So there is a biodegradable plastic now. The old one was just plastic that broke down into small particles of plastic, which truly wasn't biodegradable. And I'm guessing Heather might mention that, but there now is one that's sold. It's a little more money, but it does actually break down. So again, that may be something that we would caution on. We could do wood chips or uh, bark, some organic material. Uh, so that is one thing that would also be possibly eligible for. Again, there has to be a resource concern that we need to launch that. <laughs> okay, other practices that might be considered when we come out and look at your farm. Diversions are a channel that goes across the slope and protects 
as water is coming down into your field, it might divert it somewhere so you don't have a uh, saturated field. And then if that water needs to be carried down the slope or across ways, we can do grass waterways or rock line waterways. Something else that we could look at when we're out of visiting. Okay, typically not considered uh, are ponds, subsurface drain, and subsurface drains. And the reason behind that is that there are wetland issues associated with that, and we also are not supposed to do something that's considered a true production practice. I mean, the greenhouse is somewhat of it, but we're protecting other things. But we're really not supposed to, because of free trade agreements, we're not supposed to do something that just is for production higher crops or more crops. So fertilizer, lime, they don't cost share on. So, okay, NRCS, any of our Northeast Cato offices, we're in Newport, that's the contact. And I'm in St. Johnsbury, that's my contact information there. There's also one in White River uh, that helps with the Northeast or the uh, east side of the state. And then there's throughout the rest of the state. So you can find one, just Google and our CS for So, and should we entertain any questions? We've got time? Yeah, plenty of time. Plenty of time. Got a couple minutes for questions, if anyone has any questions for Nick. So take the next slide. This is what I'd like to say. <laughs> Legally to grow at this point, and I think everybody knows 
industrial hemp has THC levels um, at 0.3 or below, and this includes grain crops, fiber crops, and then other um, hemp produced for other uh, outputs, I guess, like CBD and terpenes and you know other uses, but not to produce THC. This is our research plots at UVM. Um, we do have this little sign up there, so nobody gets any crazy ideas. The We're funny thing, the funniest part about this sign is that now all the people that work for me up at the research farm think that we have cameras on them. So they all want to know where the cameras are every day when they're out there working, and we don't. We don't have any cameras, actually. <laughs> where are the cameras? Everybody, the efficiency really picked up after we. It's like amazing how hard people worked every day when they thought they were being watched. Yeah. Where can we all get those signs? We just had them made um, at a local place in St. Albans. I'm happy to share the design with people, you know. Um, but yeah, we just had them printed locally. I think they're they're actually nice metal signs, and you know, it's it's probably worth doing if you're especially afraid of you know robbery, <laughs> which a lot of people are. Um, so it's worth putting up. We're also right on the Canadian border, so we get some good protection from the border <laughs> the border patrol too. So we don't get too much that. Okay, so hemp is actually a very versatile plant. It's found growing all over um, North America, you know, way up north and way down south. Um, and it's also grown all over the world, as many people know. So, you know, if people wondered if it could be grown here, of course it can. It actually can be grown in a lot of different places. I think something unique about hemp that if you're a beginner you may may or may not know or understand is that um, hemp is a dioecious plant and there's not that many plants in the plant world that have males and female plants. Okay, so that's really different when we think about corn or other crops like that. They have the male and female parts on one plant, but hemp tends to have them on separate plants. So you actually need male plants and female plants to be able to produce seed. Now, obviously, if you're growing for CBD, um, you don't want seed. So what don't you want in your field? Males, Males okay? So uh, that's uh, something a lot of people don't know, that when you buy <coughs> seed, unless it's been confirmed to be feminized, and even then you can have some issues with that, you're probably going to get some males and some female seed. And, you know, how much will you get of each one? Well, it, it depends, but it can be, you know, upwards of 50-50. Okay, so if you're thinking, well, I'm going to kind of buy some cheaper seed that's not feminized, just know that some will be males and some will be females. And if you don't want seed production, you got to get rid of the males. Okay, so it's extra work, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, so there's tons of uses, as everybody knows, you know, hemp is the miracle plant. It can do anything. <laughs> I mean, I have heard all kinds of things that it can do. Uh, I even heard people used to wake their butt with the uh, leaves of the can. I mean, anything. So, I don't know if that's true. I actually just made that up. <laughs> Crowd, so I chose the word butt instead. Yeah. But anyway, and plus the, they're kind of rough, so I'm not sure if that really works here. But there's lots of different uses for, for hemp, and you know, everybody has heard it. Everybody knows it can do a million things. I always joke because my um, family is French Canadian, and I'm sure there's a few of you here too that are French Canadian, and my um, grandparents always used to raise hogs, and my Mom would always say, oh, you can just use everything on a hog, you know, and oh, oh, we would just eat all kinds of things from those pigs. But that's the way I kind of picture hemp, too. You can, like, use every part of it for some different use, you know, whether it's making paper or extracting oils or, you know, just anything and everything. So it is truly a very versatile plant. So we have a lot of opportunities here. And I think that, you know, we have one opportunity in front of us right now with CBD production, but, you know, I'm sure everybody's talking, well, how long is that going to last, you know? And that's a good conversation to have because it's true. Like, who knows how long the bubble of, you know, getting paid big money for CBD will last. 
but hemp is a really versatile plant. So we should also be thinking about what are the other opportunities for us to use this plant um, as you know, usage and potential evolves uh, in the state. So we're thinking pretty narrowly right now, some, some of you, some of us, but there are much broader uses. And as we go through time, we're gonna have to be evolving just like we have agriculturally for years um, to be moving on to the next use. Okay, so again, there's male plants that produce pollen and female pr plants that produce ovaries. And then there can also be hermaphrodites that have both boy or male and female parts on the plant. So we definitely don't want hermaphrodites out in the field either because that means they can still produce seed. But once in a while you get hermaphrodites and that can be you know, more common if you have feminized seed. The, the difficult thing is for most of us, um, it's really hard to distinguish the male plants from the female plants until they're actually expressing their gender. Um, and that really, for the most part, is when they're flowering. Now, there are some really skilled individuals that can pick out and gender type male plants sort of early on, but that's not most of us. <laughs> that's, you know, some highly skilled individuals. And I've tried to do this, and I've tried to learn how to do it, and I still haven't quite picked it up. So it's not that easy to gender type plants out in the field until you actually start to see them producing their reproductive parts. So the male plants, here's a picture of one here. They tend to be taller. They're more spindly. They're less robust. They're kind of the weaklings um, compared to the females. They usually die right after shedding pollen. So. You know, if you're growing grain um, or fiber, you can see them clearly in the field because they, they just die after they shed pollen. Um, you know, one of the issues here is that the, they're specialized for pollen dispersal by wind. So that's a real issue if you're somebody that has males in your field um, and your neighbor's also growing CBD hemp and your males are blowing pollen all over the place because that's what you know, they've evolved to do is spread lots of pollen by wind. And we get quite a bit of wind in most parts of Vermont. So the pollen will easily be dispersed. Um, this is something I like to clear up too. A lot of people say, oh, the bees love hemp. Well, they, <laughs> they, they may very well be hanging out on the hemp, but unless it's a male plant, they're not making honey from your hemp. Okay, just to be clear about that, because I do hear that a lot. Oh, yeah, you know, the bees are going to be so happy. Well, they don't actually get anything. Anyway, just so you know. <coughs> so, you know, you're not starting up your um, whole CBD operation to make honey when that's really actually not going to happen. Okay, um, so male plants, lots of pollen. It actually loses viability after about day three, it starts to go down. Most of the pollen does drop right around the plant, but again, because of the dispersal uh, potential, you know, isolation is recommended to be up to 15 miles. Um, now, this is also in places where there's not trees and valleys and mountains, but um, you know, a safe distance is about 15 miles for actual pure isolation. So there are places that have set isolation distances, and I'll, I'll show you that in a second. So the flowers, so the female plants um, have flowers in these, what we call an auxiliary inflorescence. So, you know, the flower bud itself, it's not just, um, you know, the big bud, we call it the big bud in the middle, is actually lots of little flowers all together. So it's not just one big flower. They're all pushed together very tightly. All right, so again, the isolation distances. This is from, I think, Washington State and Oregon State. The required distance for a certified seed crop um, is three miles. And if you have marijuana fields that you're trying to protect, it's 15 miles, okay? So it just kind of gives you a sense of what you're going to need to do to isolate your fields if you're trying to keep things pure. Um, if you do know somebody that's growing grain hemp or fiber hemp um, close by, those fields will likely have uh, males in them, okay, not always, but um, there is some seed that's monoecious. Um, but 
yeah, you'll want to have some good isolation distance there. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. All right. So um, the trichomes, which are all over the plant, actually, that's where um, these secondary chemicals are produced. So the CBD and the THC and the terpenes, they're all actually in those little hairs. They kind of look like little hairs on the plant. Um, and that's where these secondary chemicals are produced, like CBD and THC. Now, the con most high concentration of the secondary chemicals is in that inflorescence or in the flower buds, but there's also, you know, those same chemicals produced on the stems and on the leaves, but it's not as concentrated. So it is throughout the whole plant in these trichomes, so you can see they hang right off the plant. It's not inside of the plant, okay, it's on the outside. Um, and that's where the secondary chemicals are produced. And there's lots of different kinds of trichomes on the plant. You know, why a cannabis plant does what it does, people have no idea. <laughs> there's so, so much to learn in this area. Um, you know, why would they produce more CBD um, or more THC? When does the pathway switch from one to the other? You know, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of anecdotal uh, information out there, but because, you know, producing these crops has been illegal in the United States for a very, very long time, there just hasn't been very much research done to explain a lot of the chemical process that happens in cannabis. So largely, we don't have a lot of answers. You'll hear a lot, like, oh, if you provide too much nitrogen, um, you will produce more THC. If you don't do this, you'll get THC. If you do this, you'll get CBD. There's not really, you know, a lot of scientific evidence to show any of that is true or not, okay? So, you know, peop some people have a lot of experience growing cannabis <laughs> before it was legal, um, whatever. And so, you know, they, they generally tend to have a lot of experience on what happens when you do certain things. But, you know, if you look into the scientific literature or call up your local university or extension office, they're not going to have, you know, a lot of information about that, okay? So we are, again, like I said, largely really at the beginning of trying to understand all of this, and we're in it together. So, um, you know, trying to work with Stephanie at the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, myself at UVM, and with you, hopefully we can collect more data um, and information about cannabis much quicker now that it's legal to get more information to people. Okay, so these are all the different chemicals that are found in cannabis, basically the classes of chemicals. And you can see that cannabinoids actually make up a good, you know, kind of good chunk of the chemicals um, that are found in cannabis. So it is, you know, a pretty big opportunity there. It's not a small, small amount. Okay, so let's get into um, seed probably what I get the most questions on or have <laughs> in the last um, couple of months. So grain and fiber uh, specific varieties are available. You can actually buy those in other states right now. You can probably get seed out of Colorado, Kentucky. Um, now as of yesterday we can now import seed um, from Canada into the U.S much more easily than we have been able to. You do not need a DEA permit anymore to do that. So that's really exciting. And I will say um, a special thank you to Senator Leahy um, and also another senator in Montana that made that happen in about two weeks. So if it wasn't for them, there'd be a lot of unhappy farmers in Montana and North Dakota waiting on millions of pounds of seed to come into the U.S. without any way to get it. So, so moving seed is a lot easier now. Um, grain and fiber varieties are really specific to that type of production. They tend to be, what I would say, very stable, okay? Um, you don't necessarily, you're not really worrying about them producing high THC. That's, that's not um, a concern with these varieties, especially those um, that have been certified specifically for grain and fiber and that are coming out of Canada in particular, we've never had an issue with those spiking in THC. They wouldn't be on the market if they did, okay? 
They've been on the market in Canada for quite a long time and they'd be considered pretty stable. The level of T, uh, CBD that they produce is very, very low as well. So you're looking at 1% or 2%. Um, there are a couple of varieties, one fiber variety in particular, Carmagnola, um, that can produce, that I've seen produce up to 5% CBD. And plus it's a really good fiber crop. So there are, are some dual purpose opportunities, I think. Um, and again, as we're thinking towards the future, that's something we have to be looking at. Okay, so if anybody needs help with grain or fiber, let me know. Again, that's male and female seed for the most part. CBD seed. Um, just Google it on the internet and you'll find lots of people selling um, seed that is for the purpose of producing CBD. And there are many people selling seed in Vermont too. Is anybody here selling seed? One, just one, two. Maybe you don't want to announce it. <laughs> That's fine too. Okay. Um, so it's available. I would say that um, I got an email from somebody the other day. Maybe I have this number wrong, but that they just issued 55,000 growing permits in California um, for this year. So the amount of seed is shrinking very quickly. <laughs> um, so I would say, you know, hopefully you have your seed for this season. Uh, especially if you're doing larger acreages, it may become pretty difficult to access a lot of seed. Um, I don't know how much seed you have, but maybe a lot. You should go a lot. <laughs> calling California right now. Um, just kidding. Okay, so finding seed isn't that difficult. I think the really important um, thing that people have to understand is right now, there, you know, the the CBD seed industry. Is, is in its infancy. There's no real quality control or regulation or really um, testing oversight for the most part. Um, and so when people call me and say, how do I know that if I buy this, it'll be okay? And I say, I don't know. <laughs> um, because there's really nothing put into place right now that is going to give you that certificate that says this plant will not produce any THC or will always be below the allowable level. Like that, I, to, in my mind, I, I, I just haven't seen that. Okay, so, so there is a risk. And the best thing that you can do is find a, a, a reputable seed business, maybe that's been around a lot, that you know a lot of other people are using. People have been growing hemp in Vermont for a couple of years, maybe three. You know, so just talking amongst each other, trying to find out what has worked for other people. I will say that there has been a lot that hasn't worked. Um, and now that testing is going to become um, and Stephanie will talk about this, you know, will become more of a requirement, you know, you're not going to want to lose your 50 acre crop really to having too high THC, right? That's a huge risk. But one that we're all, um, you know, we're all at the mercy of right now, okay? So, I mean, it's just a word of caution. I don't have any answers for you of the best place. Um, you can get certificates of analysis from people showing that their seed, you know, produced certain levels of CBD, was below certain levels in THC. Those are good things to have. Um, get as much information as you can, but again, you know, there's no guarantees. Um, and we, we personally had to destroy crops last year that we thought we got seed from a reputable source. Um, and I mean, it just happened. It was a hot year. Um, so anyway, so I don't have a lot of advice except you, you gotta ask around, get as much information as you can. <clears throat> Be careful. Um, you know, if you're buying seed, you gotta know if it's feminized, right? Or if it's not, if it's not feminized, it's gonna have males in it. So you just have to know that, okay? And you're gonna have to get rid of them. And for most people, again, that's going to be when it's growing in the field. So, you know, you're going to have to be on top of it, going out and roguing out the males. It's just another thing to do. The seed is cheaper, right? If you buy um, 
seed that's not feminized is going to be quite a bit cheaper. You're going to get it in bulk even, <laughs> um, not at one seed a piece. Uh, but, you know, that's what you're going to be dealing with. Okay? Um, feminized seed is more expensive. You know, you're talking a dollar plus per seed at least. Um, and it will likely be um, a female plant, but you know, an issue that many people have had is that there's a lot of hermaphrodites often when you buy feminized seeds. So last year I got a call from a farmer and a third of their plants that they had um, out in the field were hermaphrodites. So they had to go out and destroy them. Okay. So it, just because you're buying feminized seed doesn't mean that you also won't have to go out and do some roguing. Okay. Basically, there again is no... 100% guarantee that every single plant will end up a female, but the chances are a lot better. Right? Um, so clones is another way to go, and you know clones are plants that have been taken from a mother plant, so it's a female, and you're basically taking a cutting off of it, rooting it, okay, and making another plant. So you know that those plants are identical to the mother plant and that they will all be females. That's expensive. Um, it's going to cost you a lot more to put those in the ground. So you're going from a dollar seed to maybe up to five dollars a clone. Maybe three. You can get a good deal. Okay. Um, and, and or you can purchase CBD starts. So starts are just like you would be purchasing tomato starts for your garden. Somebody has put seeds in potting mix in the greenhouse, sprouted them, and grown them up into a seedling. Okay? So again, there are people selling starts, and I've seen it all over the Veg and Berry listserv. I've seen it come across my email through maybe Hetty Vermont, someplace like that. Just be clear, if you're buying starts, are, is it feminized seed starts? Or are they seeds and you still may have male plants, okay? Starts, the CBD starts, if you're buying those, you know, I've seen two to three bucks on those and, and higher. So you can see the cost. This is where a large part of your cost will be in growing CBD hemp. All right, so I'm already almost out of time. <laughs> we haven't even gotten into the field yet. So the feminized seed, you know, you can read about this on the internet. You're basically just tricking the seeds um, and the hormones in them to produce feminine seed. Regular versus feminized, we already talked about this. Yeah? Okay, all right, I'll just keep yelling till then. <laughs> okay, now, I, uh, I, where's Stephanie? Stephanie, we should try to do this maybe, I don't know. This, uh, my, my husband, sorry, my husband Ron found this on the internet and he said, oh, have you seen this? And I said, no, I haven't. So Wisconsin government put together this approved hemp CBD variety list. Um, now again, it doesn't really, so they're basically saying, you know, here's the list uh, for Wisconsin of approved varieties, but they just have certificates of analysis, so it doesn't, still mean that it might not produce THC, but it does give you a list of varieties that have been able to produce some certificate of analysis. So you can find this on the internet, um, and I'm happy to send it to people. It doesn't actually, um, it doesn't tell you where to buy them, <laughs> but it, it does, you know, list a bunch of varieties. So I don't know how they came about the, you know, making those selections. But I did feel that this was a little bit helpful. What selections do you use? What, for selecting the varieties? Uh, what, what do you use on your farm? Uh, so we have been using um, Auto 1 and 2 and, and Bayox or Boox or whoever, however you want to pr pronounce it, and a cross of um, Box by Auto. And I found those to be very stable under a variety of growing conditions. But their CBD concentrations tend to be on the lower end. So at maximum, I've seen them produce 14%, but at minimum, depending on how we're growing them, 5%. So, you know, if you're, you know, 
want higher than really probably an average of 10%, you might want to look for another variety. And that's just the flower buds. So the biomass would be, you know, lower because you'd be diluting it. Okay. I'm not going to go over that. So how much do you need? Right? So Nick was talking about this plant spacing deal. <clears throat> so I would say what I see for standard spacing is either this five by five, so five feet between the plants in all directions, right? So five feet this way, five feet between the rows. That seems to be pretty standard or a little bit more, six by six or a little bit less, four by four, right? So those are theoretically the number of plants you need growing in the field to fill that acre, okay? So let's say you go with the five by five and you're paying a dollar a seed can see your seed costs per acre are going to be high and that's if you think every seed is going to germinate and make it to the field okay so if you're paying you know a buck a seed which actually is pretty cheap <laughs> um, for feminized seed you're looking you know roughly probably about two thousand bucks an acre just for seed now if then you have some place to get these started you're going to put them in a greenhouse you got the cost of that the potting mix and whatever else you know you're paying for okay if you're just going to plant seed which you can do I'm not sure if I'd recommend it but you can do that um, you know you're looking at a bit you know just basic cost per acre of a few thousand bucks just for the genetics right so you can just start your cost of production right there <laughs> okay so and then if you're buying plants at three bucks a piece you're looking at quite a bit more right Six thousand bucks just for the plant material to put on in the ground. Okay, so it's like a range of two thousand to six thousand per acre to get plants out in the field. I'm just saying. I mean, this is reality. Okay. How how long do you need to have before between the time you put the plants in the soil and the time you put the plants in the ground in, I a, think, in a greenhouse yeah probably about a month i don't somebody may have more experience there you go about a month or six months, six months. yeah not too not too much not too little you can speak up if you'd like yeah, four to six weeks four to six weeks kind of like a tomato plant okay all right all right so here oh okay <laughs> it's good to not get stagnant yeah. Um, so here's, you know, an operation that Rye Matthews um, provided these pictures. You can just see the, dip, the starts um, that he produced in a greenhouse. So just giving you a visual of that. All right, soil testing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but, you know, <laughs> You're paying 2,000 bucks for the seed that you're gonna put in the ground outside. Please make sure that the ground outside is ready to put in that expensive investment, right? Don't, I mean, everybody's worrying about what seed they're gonna plant. Well, if you don't have the ground ready, there's no fertility or too much or the pH is too low, you know, all your best efforts on the front end are gonna fail quickly if your soil conditions aren't, you know, proper. Because they're gonna spend most of their time out there, okay? So please take a soil test. <laughs> Don't ask me to come out and tell me your plants are dying from tobacco mosaic virus. <laughs> when I get out there and they're actually dying because the pH is five and a half, you know, which is something you could have fixed, right? So this is potentially high value crop, but the investment to get there is also high so the cheapest thing you can do is take the $15 soil test okay you can do it right now the ground's probably still a little frozen in spots up here but um, you know it takes a week or so to get turnaround so just make sure the pH you can see the soil pH right on the top you need that above six okay I mean, I'd ideally like to see it around six and a half, but definitely above six. And if it's not above six, you need to get some lime on the soil ASAP and tilled into the ground. You know, it takes months for it to react. 
So if you're already starting off with a low pH, you know, it's going to hurt your plants as they're trying to grow. Okay? And the soil test will tell you lots of other things too about how much fertility to add. You know, and we're happy to help answer questions on that once you have the soil test. But if you call me and ask me, how do I fertilize my hemp? I'm going to ask you, what does the soil test say? Because otherwise, it's just a shot in the dark, and I don't really know. And I can actually do more harm than good without knowing. Okay? So there's, you know, hemp, regardless of popular belief, needs fertilizer to grow. <laughs> um, it does grow like a weed when it has everything that it needs, okay? Um, it is huge. It will grow large like the pictures Nick showed us. I don't know. Where the hell was that? <laughs> anyway, I've seen it. I've seen it. The poor deer was even like, what the? Um, all right. So uh, phosphorus is, is a nutrient that hemp needs but not very much of, okay? So there's this, I uh, keep hearing people saying, oh, we're going to save the lake by growing hemp because it's going to take up all this phosphorus. Well, it actually doesn't use much phosphorus at all. Half a percent of the total, half a percent of the total biomass is phosphorus, okay? Still need phosphorus in the soil. So if your soil test is low or medium, you still need to add a little bit, but it doesn't require a lot of phosphorus. Potassium. It requires a little more of. Two and a half to three percent of the biomass is made up of potassium. So roughly, you know, if you have a medium soil test, um, you'll probably need about 60 to 70 pounds of potassium, right? Um, now nitrogen is a nutrient that hemp uses a lot of. This is really high. I mean, very few crops are composed of five to six percent nitrogen. I mean, even corn is lower than that. So even hops, which is closely related, is only 3% N. So it requires a lot of nitrogen. Um, and, you know, really we're looking at about 100 to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And you can figure out on a pl per plant basis as well if that's how you're going to fertilize. But it's way more than what people think. Okay? Now you, um, manure is really good for hemp. Okay, so that's a good fertility source, and you might need additional nitrogen on top of that. You know, really depends on what you're going into. I cannot give you an exact answer because everybody's soil is different, and the history of what you've done to it is different. If it's had manure for the last 50 years, and the organic matter level is 7%, you know, you're probably not going to need a whole lot, but you know, a lot of people aren't going into that, right? So just so you know, you're looking at a good amount of N. And does N impact THC? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen that happen, but we will be evaluating that this year. Oh, it's about 15 minutes. Okay. If you're growing for grain or fiber, okay, these are recommendations for grain or fiber. So you're seeding pounds of seed. You're seeding it with a grain drill, not, you know, like a, in a garden. So the plants are very close together. They're seeded with a grain drill, basically. They're grown in rows that are six inches apart, <coughs> not six feet apart, all right? Um, I will say that there is a company in Middlebury, Victory Hemp, that is looking to buy grain, hemp grain, and they're paying a very good price and they are writing contracts with people. So if you're not sold into CBD, but you really want to grow some hemp, you might want to reach out to them. They, at our grain conference, said they were paying 70 cents a pound um, for grain, conventional and a dollar ten organic. I mean, that's a really good return for a grain crop. So um, you harvest it with a combine. Plant it with a grain drill, harvest it with a combine. Okay? We get good grain yields in Vermont. Um, 2016, we averaged a ton. 2017, which was like the most awful growing season, I think, for everybody, we were down to 600 pounds. Is in kilos, but um, and then last year we were at about 1500. Okay, so a buck a pound, 
ton, you know, your return per acre can be good for seed as well. You harvest it with a regular combine, okay? All right, so we'll talk about um, producing hemp for CBD a little bit, and then we'll have to end. And there's a lot of other people that are gonna talk and give you more information. So Nick already mentioned, there are just, there are so many ways for you to do this. Um, I mean, and that's farming in general. No two farms look the same. They all look very different. Um, and so whatever way you decide to grow hemp, you know, you're gonna figure out what works for you. Um, you know, here's hemp grown on black plastic um, in, uh, uh, this is down in Addison County. So you can see, you know, different size of plants, different row spacings. You can use black plastic. You don't have to, okay? Here's an example of hemp grown just in the ground, <laughs> okay? So it looks kind of like a little Christmas tree farm, basically, all right? But, you know, if you're not using black plastic, there's more weeds. You know, that really, in some ways, is the primary benefit to using black plastic in my mind. We don't really, we don't need the extra heat at that time of the year, okay? So generally, you know, you use black, black plastic to get extra heat um, and to reduce weeds and diseases to some extent. So in my experiments, the other reason to use black plastic is splash up of soil onto the plants. So if you have huge plants and you have a lot of branches, you know, or stems, call them branches like a tree, um, near the ground and you have a really rainy season, the lower part of the plant can just be, you know, it'll have to be discarded because it gets a lot of soil on it. If you're on black plastic, that's not an issue. So you get every, every bit of harvestable material, okay? But it's a lot more expensive. Okay, so again, here's hemp just grown in the ground. Um, you can see how you could easily plant cover crops between the row. Nick mentioned that already. You could easily mow between the rows. You know, um, again, there's no right way to do this. You could plant seeds. You can plant um, starts. You can plant clones. You know, there's somebody, the growers panel, can. Well, they'll all tell you the ways that they've done it. Now we've used black plastic in some of our trials. You need special equipment. You're using a lot of plastic. There is biodegradable plastic. Biotello is not allowed on organic farms. So if you're certified organic, it's not permissible for use right now. But if you are not organic, you can use it and it'll degrade out in the field. Okay? But you need a special piece of equipment to do this. And if you're laying black plastic, how does the rain get in? Unless you get a lot of rain, <laughs> it doesn't. Which is why then you gotta irrigate, okay? So if you grow it in the ground, I'm gonna say there's definite benefits to having irrigation, but most of our crops in the state of Vermont do just fine rain fed, okay? And the yield boost that you might get from irrigating is not that substantial, and I'll show you that in a minute, okay? So again, you have to decide how much you're gonna invest. If you just invested $6,000 in plant material, <laughs> you know, and do you feel okay putting them right into the soil without added irrigation? You got a crew to be out there weeding to make sure the weeds don't overtake that $6,000 investment, you're going to be just fine, okay? But if you don't have any labor to weed um, and the field's a weed mess, you might be thinking about plastic. But then you got to irrigate. You have water, okay? And not if, how many people have ever irrigated anything here? This is like foreign to the majority of the people in the state of Vermont, like five people, okay? Six. <laughs> we do. We have done both. Okay? So I'm just saying, when you're from Vermont, irrigation is like foreign language, right? And you think that the little puddle next to your house is going to give you enough water to, you know, water a crop. 
you got another thing coming. I mean, it takes a lot of water. Okay, so just think about an inch of rain. If you're supplying an inch of rain a week, that's 22,000 gallons of water, you know? It's just, it's a lot of water. So you gotta have a really good water source. So just, you know, these are things to consider. Yeah. Are there two different I'm gonna show you. Yep. Okay, so you know the cost of this equipment, it's not it's not overwhelming. Okay, it's not like going out and buying a new combine or even a new tractor. Um, anybody have a price? This is a one row bed shaper. This is a cheap one. That one's a cheap one. Okay, you want it to have the irrigation, you know, be able to lay the irrigation at the same time. Anybody just buy one, got a price on it? Five grand. Five grand. For one row with like a rain flow? Uh, rain flow, one row, plastic, okay. and yep. irrigation layer. Okay, so five grand. And rain flow is about the best you can do, really. Those are really good. Uh, you can buy cheaper ones, but you could get a divorce over it. I know <laughs> my husband's still here with me. Because we bought a rain flow bed shaper. <laughs> we used to have a buckeye and I, we almost got a divorce over it. Right, dear? <laughs> so remember calling our neighbor farmer saying, if you want my marriage to survive, you'll let us use your truck and trailer to go get this new bed shaper. <laughs> Alright, whatever, you didn't need to know all that, but that's just a true story. Um, Alright, so again, the bed shaper plastic mulch layer with irrigation, those should be combined into one. Once you lay that black plastic, you're either going to plant by hand, okay, or you're going to buy a transplanter. And a transplanter is probably another five grand for a small one. I don't remember what ours costs, but okay. So, you know, maybe another $10,000 investment for a small, um, small scale transplanter, bed shaper, plastic mulch layer, okay. And then the irrigation investment too. But again, all of their crops, they can be grown in the soil without all of that too. But, you know, you just have to think about all the pieces. Okay, so here's, this is last year, right? Um, a lot of people got rain at the end of the season. We got nothing all year. I mean, I think we had 12 total inches, which is, you know, a small fraction of what we would normally get. And so um, these are actually, uh, these are opposite. I screwed that up. I really apologize. The rain fed is actually this lower one at about, it was 1.35 pounds okay, of dried bud. And the irrigation was a little over two. Okay? So there was a benefit to irrigating, but last year was also the driest year for us. Um, I think almost on record. So we didn't get any rain um, for, I think at one point it was about seven weeks. And, and we still got 1.35 pounds of dry material per plant without irrigation. And if you didn't hear what I said, I screwed up the labels because <laughs> I was making it in the back as I was thinking, oh, I should show them that. Okay? But the point is, you can still get good yields without irrigation, even in an extremely dry year. These are both on plastic? No. So the irrigation, which is actually that one, okay, was on black plastic with irrigation. And then this, this one over here was just rain fed, no black plastic, just in the soil. So again, just think about the investment, you know, and where you're at right now. So you can get decent yields either way, okay? Now in our, you know, depending on the, the same variety, this is box or bay ox or whatever it was. Um, but you know, the point is that looks like a big difference. It's not a huge difference, okay? Yeah, um, somebody had a question? Yeah, that was me, Heather. Um, uh, did you, because you said it's a dry year, did you have splash back of soil on the on Plastic. We did, I think, mean, because by the time we harvested in October, um, it was actually quite, it was quite a loss. So that actually includes the loss. The loss. Okay, that's yep. About. Yep. How, about, how about maintaining the plants where you didn't hear, where you didn't use? We hand weeded, and we also had cover crops. We planted the cover crops, so they were, they were, uh, they were both clones. 
that we put in the ground. They were small clones. They were about this big. Um, they were planted and hand weeded for a while. Um, and, and that was easy in a dry year. <laughs> there wasn't that many weeds. And then we did have some cover crops between some, because we have plots, you know, it's research. But we used um, annual ryegrass, okay? And it tends to grow pretty low. And so would white clover. Okay, so those are both two cover crops that grow quickly and stay relatively low. Now what you wouldn't want to do is put your plants out there and then spread a bunch of seed between them too early, right? So you may have to go out and try to weed a little bit. And once the plants really get going, you could go in and, and spread some cover crop seed. Yeah? What about a sprinkler system for water? Yeah, the only, um, I, I think that would be fine. The only thing that I would caution is just disease. You know, so disease on the plants. So that, that would be the issue with any kind of overhead watering. Okay, and it really would depend on the variety. So here's just some more information from our trials. All of this is on the internet. So you guys can find all these trials on the internet. So you can see auto from seed outdoor. The blue bar is the dry bud weight was less than a pound. Auto um, clone. Indoor, so under these little caterpillars, gave us two pounds, and then the box clone indoor gave us about three pounds. And indoor is just under these like little hoop house things that Nick was talking about. So we do get much higher yields growing undercover on black plastic with irrigation. The yields can definitely be about double what they are outside, but on scale, that's kind of difficult. Was, okay. there, was there a difference between uh, fertilization of your covered irrigated crops as opposed to your non-covered? Nope. Nope. Not at all. Um, all right. So then here's percent CBD. And like I said, these are not really high producing CBD strains. Um, so you can see the box is about, you know, it was about 11 and then the auto was a little bit lower. So you can see, and again, this is all on the internet, so you can find it on there. This is from this year, so that, that was 2016, or 2017, this is 2018. So you can see indoor, especially cherry wine, um, yielded a lot more. <laughs> it must just like being grown indoor better, okay? So this is really um, what we're going to do this year, hopefully is expand our variety trial now that we don't have to get all our seed from the DEA or through the DEA process. Um, and we have 12 varieties that we'll be trialing to try to understand production. This is really, these are really important points, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, just so you can see most varieties, it didn't really matter if they were indoor or outdoor, but some really did. Okay, this Carmagnola and Aletta, those are fiber varieties that we're evaluating for CBD. Okay. All right, so we have also looked at plant spacing. Okay. Um, and we've looked at one by one, three by three, and five by five. And this has brought up interesting discussion amongst people. <laughs> that you can see on a per acre basis, pounds per acre, that growing less plants um, or less spacing provides more yield. Kind of makes sense, okay? Um, quite a bit more yield than a standard five by five planting, but you gotta have a lot more plants and there's a lot more investment that may not be worth that little bit of additional yield, right? If you're one foot by one foot, instead of um, 1,700 plants, you know, you're looking at 4,000 some plants. So the amount of seed per acre, the cost of uh, plant material per acre goes way up. And then it was dry last year. We don't know how diseases, you know, would be impacted in a wetter year, with the plants closer together. All right, we've also looked at planting dates and, um, you know, we see the highest planting date when we're planting around mid-June um, and these were just you know these were in June you could probably plant earlier too but just to show you you can plant quite late if you need to you need more time no nope, that's when they went in the ground 
and they were plants. They were How long is, what are the, the growing degree days on well, you know, these plants are photo period sensitive. So, you know, their their production, unless you know, there's there are exceptions. <laughs> but usually, you're planting, you know, between the end of May and the end of June, and you're harvesting pretty consistently, you know, end of September, middle of October. And there are some varieties that, um, you know, do not follow that rule. But for the most kind of where you're at. I mean, up here we get cross before we go. So I'm going to show you, maybe this is what I'm showing you. Yep. <laughs> so last year it got really cold really fast. Um, and so we did an experiment row covering the hemp that we had versus not row covering it <laughs> to see if it could protect the plants and what would happen to the CBD concentrations itself if, if it got below 30 degrees. So here's the temperature, and you can see um, the lowest that we hit was 27.8 degrees. So you can see the blue blue uh, dots, mm -hmm. and that was with no row cover. Okay, so the temperature got down to 27.8, and then you can see the orange is with row cover. So with row cover, it stayed quite a bit warmer. It never hit that low 27 degrees. Um, and actually, it really stayed above 32 for the most part. So it did provide protection to the plants. But what I really wanted to know was, do you need to do that? What is What happens to the CBD? Excuse me. Yes. When you say row cover. Just that fabric, fabric row cover. Have you seen that? Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, you got a five or six foot plant. These were very tall, too. We still covered them. You know, it was, because what kept coming up, the question kept coming up, what happens when we get below 30 degrees? What's going to happen to these plants? There were nobody that, nobody had an answer to that. So, feasibly, you're probably not going to go rope cover your whole field, although many of us do if we have to. <laughs> you figure out a way. Um, and really it was just to see if we could keep it a little bit warmer. You know, it's an experiment. So we were trying to see, well, would row cover actually keep it warm enough? Um, and does it matter? Like, will the CBD be impacted if it gets below 30 degrees? And the answer was no. It didn't seem to. So look over here at the end. So we did this for about a week. We took samples. Row cover versus no cover. Okay, so with no row cover, there was really no difference in CBD, total potential CBD. Look at the end, the average. Okay, so with row cover, it was 9%, and without it, it was 9.4. So it didn't matter. So we could hit those below 30 degree temperatures, and this was just a week that we had pretty cool temperatures, and then after that, kind of warmed up a bit. But at least over that week time, it didn't seem to impact the CBD concentration. So that's good news. Some people would say the cold would turn it up. It well, might. It also might turn your THC up and put it over. Well, it didn't. I have the THC numbers too, and it actually didn't impact those either. But you know, we don't. Like I said, we don't have. We don't have this information, and we had the opportunity to collect it last year, so we did. <laughs> what okay. about blight moving in the air? Yep. So. Versus tomato plants. Yeah. So the pest pressure. I'm running out of time very fast. Um, we haven't seen a lot of insect pressure. Uh, aphids, some people have had a few issues with aphids, but overall, we haven't seen much devastating impacts. The biggest thing is corn borer. Okay, so that is an issue in hemp, and we have seen problems with that. I love it when people come in and they're like, I have the Eastern or the European hemp borer. I'm like, no, you don't. No <laughs> way. So, but this is a problem, and we grow corn in Vermont, um, so there is a lot of corn borer around, and it, it does like hemp. And actually, if you look at the historical literature, uh, corn borer um, was not called corn borer in the past. It actually was. Um, its primary host was hemp in Europe, and then when they stopped growing a lot of hemp in Europe, it moved over to corn. So 
you know, makes sense that it would be bothering your head as well. Uh, are the, do you know if there's any fungi sites that are related? I would think that the disease side, side of this is a pretty heavy concern. And then the one other question, I would think that the likelihood of more disease planting closer is more likely than having more air. Yeah. Right, so what I said with the one by one, it was so dry last year, we didn't have any disease. But obviously the plant spacing further apart allows for better airflow and less potential for disease, okay? So we do see a lot of diseases in hemp. Stephanie will probably point you to the allowable products uh, to treat hemp, but we also don't really know much about uh, Say. Passing it on to you. <laughs> Residuals, you know, we are, with Stephanie's permission, and I haven't asked her yet, we are, we are gonna, we want to conduct a fungicide trial this year using approved materials um, to get a better handle on what works and what leaves residue and what doesn't. Okay, so these are a list of diseases that we get. Most of them come in uh, much later in the season, exactly when you don't want to see them. Um, because they ruin the buds on your plants. So, you know, the best thing is the plant spacing, good airflow. We don't know a lot about the resistance of varieties, but I will tell you right now, cherry wine was a beautiful plant, but it had a lot of disease. Fox and Otto hardly ever get anything. So there are differences, but we don't know a lot about it. You have to rotate these crops. If you have five acres and you think you're going to grow hemp for the next 20 years, you know, I don't have to tell you won't be able to because you'll learn it yourself if you don't listen <laughs> now. Um, but there's a lot of diseases. You're just going to have issues. You've got to rotate the crop. One of them will be white mold. And once you have that, it takes 12 years to get rid of it. So, all right. All right, so just to end off, because I'm using everybody else's time, harvesting is the next big labor requirement that you'll have. Um, if you're harvesting for biomass and you're like chopping it up, it might save you on the labor, but it lowers the CBD concentrations. Um, and then if you're doing trimmed flowers, you know, it's the most labor, but it's the highest CBD, maybe highest return. Okay, there's different machines you can buy with really nifty names like the Mother Butter and the Buddies, you know. They all cost money. You know, we're, we're moving into mechanization and so, you know, and I think people already have this equipment not too far away from here where they're just, you know, John Deere's building a harvester to be able to chop the flower buds off and so, you know, once this becomes really easy to do, the price will go down pretty quickly. <laughs> um, all right, so drying temperature, we did this experiment this year um, at 80 degrees, 105 degrees, and then at ambient temperature. Um, it says no significant difference, which meant there was a lot of variation. But you can see that drying at, you know, hotter temperatures, has an impact on the CBD concentration. And 105 degrees isn't that hot, right? So ambient temperature or even up to 80 degrees seem to be pretty safe. Um, but again, we have to do some more experiments. We get a lot of questions about that. So I'll stop with that. I think somebody else is talking about harvesting and drying, so, or drying and curing. Okay. It, yeah, we need three days, not <laughs> Thanks, so there's yeah. stuff. We'll have a little bit of time for questions yeah. maybe later if we keep rolling through okay. the presentation. So.
Marlowe, as she said, and um, I'm here because I have been referred to as the matriarch of Northeast Kingdom M. I think that means that I'm the old lady that gives the boys a hard time when they want to spend any money, but they tell me that it is a term of utmost respect, so we'll see. Um, I'm also here because it's actually a school vacation week, and my real job is teaching kids to read. So right now I'm going to visualize you all as about five to ten years old. Typically they believe everything I say. They don't always pay close attention though, so if you get a little rowdy, I'll be okay, I'll be okay with it. But, um, so that's how I happen to be here, be able to be here. Um, I could tell you how I ended up sort of living the hemp life, but that might take another whole seminar, which I'm going to try to make up some time because I think we're a little bit behind. So I'm not going to go into all of that. Needless to say, my husband is sort of famous for taking on a lot of projects. And when he takes on a project, inevitably it takes over the lives of the whole family. When he wanted chickens, who do you think ended up taking care of the chickens? You know, it's always, he has a lot of good ideas. Uh, he needs help to see them through. So as I'm talking, I'm just going to have pictures up there because then you're looking at them and not looking at me, was my theory. So I'm kind of going to cover everything that you need to know after you grow. So you're going to want to stick around for the farmer panel because they're going to actually tell you how to grow it. I'm going to do a little fast forward and go into um, what you envision doing with your crop after you get it. Um, so basically I am not um, an expert in harvest and post-processing of hemp, um, but I can share with you what we've learned over the last two and a half years being hemp farmers. So sitting over here in the corner with me is Jethro Heyman, and Jethro came to work with us at NEK at the beginning of the year when we sort of went full force from being strictly hemp farmers and product sellers to um, extracting our own oil from the hemp and doing everything from seed to shelf ourselves. So Jethro came on um, initially to kind of support our son in the lab work, but um, his skill set is such that he has taken on a lot of other responsibilities, including being sort of in charge of all of our wholesale marketing, um, sales, website work. He's keeping us moving because even though for two years before Jethro came, we had managed to grow a couple of crops. We had, um, you know, been getting, drying, processing, getting our oil extracted elsewhere. We had a, a product, we had a brand, but we really knew nothing about how to market that product and how to actually sell a lot of it. I'm a school teacher, my husband's a welder slash farmer, um, and our business plan has always been known as the one day at a time plan. So we really didn't um, have the, the training to go all the way through. So Jethro is taking all of that on with us. I'm pretty sure he did not know what he was getting into when he came to work with us, but um, none of us really knew what we were getting into when we started this whole adventure. So um, I am gonna let Jethro talk at some point, maybe, and try. So I'm gonna try to kind of go through this quickly so that he can really talk about the things that he's, he's best at. So, I'm just going to, oh, one last thing about Jethro, good thing I looked at my notes. He's also responsible for the term matriarch. I'm not sure my family knew that word, and I'm still not sure if I like that term or not, so Jethro and I are also on the one day at a time plan. <laughs> let's see. So now let's kind of talk about what they asked me to come here and talk about, which is what you're going to do. Um, after you grow this. So I'm not here to encourage or discourage anybody um, from getting into this industry, but the two reasons that I kind of did agree to do this is that um, one of the things from day one when we started this that we um, were hoping to be able to do was help other farmers. We live on a road where there used to be eight, nine operating dairy farms, of one of which my husband grew up on, and none of them are operating anymore. So he saw an opportunity to maybe revitalize some of those farms a little bit in some way. So that's, we always said we would try to help other farmers. And when we started doing this, there were not that many other farmers in Vermont, and the ones that there were, were not really interested in sharing their information. 
So we spent a lot of time and a lot of money traveling to places like Washington State and Oregon and talking to people who didn't feel threatened by somebody else getting into this business and were willing to share some of the things that we needed to know. Um, so we were hoping to be able to help as much as we possibly can. Um, the other reason is that I think there's so much talk about hemp being this big cash crop and everybody's excited about it. I'm just hoping that we can just help people kind of go into it with their eyes open. I think you've already heard a lot of things today. They're like, oh yeah, maybe you didn't know that. Or So just knowing what you're getting into, which we didn't. So you're, we're going to hopefully help you learn from our mistakes. Oh, let's see. So like any business, there are no guarantees in this business. The things that I will guarantee you is that um, growing hemp is a lot of work. And I was glad somebody mentioned that earlier. So I can guarantee you it will be a lot of work. And it also has the potential to be a ton of fun. Um, we have a great time most of the time. Um, our whole family working on this project. Um, when people ask us about it, we used to talk about it being the biggest roller coaster ride we've ever been on. Now my new thing is that um, it is the best thing that has ever happened to our family and the worst thing that has ever happened to our family. It just depends on which day you ask us because it still changes a lot. So I'm guessing all of you here um, have either already taken the plunge and are growing hemp or have started planting seeds or are considering whether or not to plant that first seed. Um, many of you probably don't intend to let hemp take over your life. Take a look at me. I'm wearing the hemp pants, I have the hemp bag, and it's possible for it to take over your life. Um, doesn't have to, but if you're planning to just do, you know, 100 plants or so, probably not going to be that bad. Um, or if you have a contract that, you know, says you're going to grow it, they're going to come and harvest it and take it away, it's maybe not going to take over your life. Um, otherwise, you know, you can pretty much keep your day job, but just start working 24 hours a day like we do. And you'll, you'll fit it all in. Uh, let's see. So I guess, you know, if you're confident in an arrangement that you have that someone's going to come and just take your crop from the field, then it's a good time for you to go take a break right now and come back to the farmer panel. In our um, experience, because this industry changes so rapidly, Contracts haven't meant much in the experience that we've had. Um, so, now, what are you going to do with that crop? So, first of all, if you're going to be harvesting it, I should have just looked at the pictures and told the story, but I was afraid I would get sidetracked. Um, if you're going to be responsible for drying your crop, um, lots of people have called us. We get calls all the time with people saying, I want to grow hemp. I want to grow 10, 10 acres. And we go, okay, you need to talk to somebody else because we don't have experience with that. We don't have experience with growing 10 acres or drying 10 acres. We grow between an acre and two is what we've done in the last couple of years. So drying 10 or 20 acres is a very different thing than what we, what we dry. There's lots of different ways. We hear about different ways every day that people are doing this. Um, one thing about my husband is he is the hardest worker you'll ever find. And I don't always say nice stuff about him because the next line is he's also very stubborn. So he believes there is one way to grow, to dry his hemp. Um, and that's the way he's going to do it, maybe forever, but at least until somebody proves to him that there is a better way. And it's not going to be a cheaper way or an easier way or a faster way. It's going to have to be a better way. So his process, um, you know, is really based on being able to preserve as much of those, as many of those trichomes, like um, Heather was talking about, as possible. Because we're growing our hemp for CBD. So we don't want to damage, destroy flavonoids, terpenes, any of that. So um, for him, it's more, it's a, it's a curing process. So he dries it slowly. Um, you know, monitoring your humidity and moisture levels and then being able to get it into sealed, vacuum sealed bags when it's just where he wants it to be. So that, um, you know, a couple of years ago when we first started, we were told along the whole way 
that somebody was going to buy our crop, every bit that we could grow, they were going to buy it, and the better it was, the better we took care of it, the better we dried it, the more they were going to pay. And they weren't talking $40 a pound back then. Um, and we were told we grew the best hemp in the state of Vermont, but we didn't sell any of that. So what I was told was, well, there's a lot more hemp in Vermont than we thought there were going to be. And I said, well, what are people going to do with it? And they said, well, we don't know. Like, nobody's ever really, you know, had to preserve it for that long. Nobody thought about that. And I said, well, I can tell you, Farmer Cam did. And his will be all safely vacuum sealed in bags as fresh a year from now as it was the day he put it in. So, you know, you just have to be thinking about what are you going to do with it um, once it's off the field. So, now that you've dried it, once you've got your drying figured out, um, you now still have a couple of options. I mean, you can sell that raw material if you have a market for that. Um, or you can have it processed into a hemp extract to either then sell that bulk oil or put it into products. Um, let's see. You know, for us, there weren't a lot of choices for places to take it to be extracted in Vermont. There's more and more opportunities now. So that will probably make it easier for people than it was for us. Um, but it definitely changes fast. So I guess the thing to remember is that nobody's going to pay you for moldy hemp. Nobody's going to pay for hemp that um, is full of leaf and stem, even though, you know, we were told, oh, yeah, we want the leaves, the stem, the stalk, everything. Grind it all up. Nobody's really going to pay you much for that. Um, so if you want, um, you know, if you want to end up with a good material, then you're going to want to take take the care that it takes to plant, uh, tend it, dry it, um, all of that carefully. Some buyers are going to be looking to pay based on CBD percentage. That seems to be the thing right now. So you don't want to be cooking everything out of it because you dried it super fast. Um, if your market is a CBD isolate market, then you may not care about preserving all of those parts of the plant. But for us, because we're using the material to make our own products, we want as much of the potency um, and the goodness as we can get. So along those lines, there's options for how to process it, depending on what you want to make. So um, you know, you can sell the material to a processor, and maybe they'll just pay you outright. Or they might want to do a trade where they keep some, give you back some oil, or you may want to pay somebody for um, extracting and get all of the material back. First thing you need to decide is what kind of extraction do you want to use? I mean, there's do-it-yourself extraction, if you're going to do your own thing in your kitchen, um, all the way to commercial <coughs> extraction, either using ethanol or CO2. Um, for us, we choose to use only CO2 just because from our own research and what we believe, and like I said, my husband's stubborn, and once he sets his mind to something, that's the way we're going to do it for a while. Um, we don't think that all extraction methods are equal or produce the same um, quality product. We believe that CO2 is the cleanest and safest and preserves, um, is the most efficient use of the whole plant, so that's how we extract. Again, if you're, if you're leaning towards an isolate market, then it would be different than what we do. Let's see. So once you choose a processing method, which could depend on the type of product that you want to make or the market that you're looking for, um, you need to think about something called post-processing and formulation. So when we first got into this and we started looking at these big, fancy extraction machines, we call them, um, I thought after we put the hemp in there, there's these little valves and we were gonna stick little bottles under there and woo, golden oil was gonna come out. It doesn't look like that when it comes out of those machines. They don't always tell you that. Well, when you know nothing, I guess you, you can miss a lot. But, um, so you're gonna need to, you know, either know how to do or hire somebody to do the kind of post-processing stuff that needs to happen to turn that crude oil into a saleable product. Um, so, um, again, there's a lot of steps involved, and depending on whether you're going to be making tinctures or topicals or edibles, then you have to know what you're going to do with that raw material. 
if you're going to use it as an ingredient in something. Um, so then comes testing. So now you have that, um, you know, crude oil or even formulated oil. Pretty much whether you're selling it in bulk or selling um, just raw material or bulk oil or a finished product, customers at every level are going to be asking for test results. Um, so you're going to need to test your crops in the field, which people have talked about. Um, and again, there are a lot more options for testing than there were even two years ago. Um, but the turnaround time can be um, pretty significant when you're sending a sample of something in to be tested and it takes anywhere between two and four weeks sometimes to get your test results back. So if you're waiting on formulating a product to know exactly what that raw material you, you have, that crude oil is, you could be waiting for a, a while if you haven't planned, planned these things out. Um, that's one of the reasons why we just bought our own testing equipment so that now we can test our own, um, do our formulations and just have third party testing done on our finished products before they go to stores. Um, and testing can be expensive uh, besides being time consuming. I mean, it can, it can um, eat up a bit of money if you're testing products along the way. So let's see. And third party testing is definitely, I think the days are over where, you know, everybody can just grow some hemp, extract some oil, mix it in some, you know, coconut or olive oil, and slap a label on it and sell it. I mean, I think the rules are coming um, and they're gonna be coming hard and fast, I'm pretty sure. So, I'm almost to the retail market. I almost might let Jethro talk. We'll see, I'm going pretty, I'm going pretty fast. Um, so before we talk about retail, one thing, I woke up at four o'clock this morning because my whole presentation somehow disappeared yesterday. So I had to do it over. And I woke up at four o'clock this morning with the words banking and insurance in my head. And I was like, oh shoot, I forgot to put banking and insurance on the late conversion, so I just want to tuck that in a little bit. Um, so when the farm bill passed, and I was even quoted in MJ Business Daily as saying, we did a little happy dance. Because um, we only didn't know the difference between the DEA being the boss and the FDA being the boss. But when the farm bill finally passed, we were like, ah, now we can, you know, do our business, have banking services like everybody else, have an online retail um, setup where people can just use credit cards to pay for their orders and none of this back and forth stuff and oh, we made it and not so much. I mean really not much has changed since the farm bill as far as any of that. I mean we do have, we were lucky even pre-farm bill to be able to buy product insurance um, but I don't and I I called my insurance guy the day that farm bill passed and said, my insurance is going to go down now, right? And he was like, well, it's not going to happen that fast. So nothing's changed yet. But, you know, you're going to pay more money for product insurance than the guy up the road who's producing something else just because your product is hemp. Um, you're going to pay more money if you can find a credit card processor who will do transactions for you than the person who's selling you know, anything else, pretty much. Um, none of that has really gotten easier yet. Um, so those are really things to think about if you're going to be um, actually producing a product that you want to sell. So besides thinking about, um, you know, having a brand, coming up with a product, something that's unique that everybody else isn't already doing, um, Labeling requirements, FDA requirements. Oh, let's see what else. If you understand the FDA rules, then you're probably quite far ahead because I don't really get them yet. But um, like I said, when like when it when it passed, when the F, uh, farm bill passed, we thought all things were good, and um, they always quote me as saying stupid things in magazines and newspapers. We've, had, we've gotten some media coverage over the past couple of years. And um, I usually start with the reporter. I think I saw one here, and I'm pretty sure I said this to him the last time I saw him, just as long as you don't quote me as saying anything stupid. And they always promise they won't. And then I've kind of come to the conclusion that I'm 
only say stupid things because everything that they quote me, I'm like, oh my god, that sounds so stupid. And then my kids said to me a little while ago, you know, the newspapers always make dad sound really smart. And I said, you know, I'm just taking one for the team. I figured the more stupid things I say, the better he'll look. So I'm, I'm just doing my part. So I think that is everything I know, in a nutshell, about after you grow up. And Jethro knows more and better about the marketing end of it. Because I was sinking in that world um, before he came along. So. You don't give yourself enough credit. Um, I don't think there's a lot more time, um, but uh, Karen here did a pretty brilliant job and creating a company that focused on quality. You know, you'll see that this is a huge process. You know, from seed to shelf, this is not simple. You really have to have a lot of things that you've got together to pull it off successfully. And there's so many different ways that you can do things, from your genetics, to how you grow, to how you fertilize, to how you harvest, to cure, to extract, to pre-post-processing, to product formulation, that every single step along the way, you get to make choices. And I really, you know, she gives her husband a hard time, but I really like the choices that they collectively had made. And I refer to her as the matriarch. From my perspective, that's definitely a term of, of deep respect, and also recognizing who's actually in charge. So, uh, that was really clear. Um, so, yeah, I, came, I got a little bit of background. I uh, got my plant soil science degree from the University of Vermont. So, I've been following farming for a long time. Grew up on a farm. Um, got my graduate degree in public communication with an emphasis on agriculture. Um, taught for six years at Cornell University's College of Agriculture and Life Science. So, this stuff has been um, really important to me for a long time. Um, to find, you know, I'm from Glover, to find uh, a town across the way, uh, someone doing exactly the way that I would do it was pretty incredible. So I basically was like, yes, I'd love to be a part of it because you're transitioning to vertical integration, which means they're going to control all their means of production. Instead of having somebody else do the extraction, somebody else do the product formulation, somebody else do all these things where you couldn't control the quality, uh, they took everything in house. So uh, since I've been on board, uh, we've um, purchased uh, a world-class uh, CO2 super and subcritical extractor and were uh, trained by world experts at a very high price, mind you, to get the best SOPs. Okay? So if you don't know much about CO2, it's a tunable solvent. You control pressure and temperature. You can do almost anything with these machines if you know how to tune it just right so that you can get everything out of the plant. Um, and not lose anything. And if you do it right, that's actually what happens. So that's, you know, sort of how I came on board is sort of seeing how uh, this process um, can be mastered and you can get the best end product. And ultimately, we're kind of unique in that we are trying to produce a finished product and not just, you know, we're not just looking at we're, we're farmers, but that's part of the overall package. Um, but it's farming to a product. And so, you know, the product formulations are not things that uh, most of y'all are going to be able to whip up in your kitchen and actually get good results. There's a lot of science that goes behind these things. There's a certain amount of art that goes behind them. Um, and so, basically, what NEK Hemp uh, can do is the full gamut of this process. You know, the most important thing for y'all to think about is where you're selling it. When these guys started, they had people say, oh, yeah, you grow up, we'll buy it didn't happen. Okay? You have to protect yourself, make sure you have a marketplace, and make sure it's, uh, you know, banks are coming to us and asking us what we think of some of the contracts that are going around right now, because they think they're terrible contracts. That doesn't mean your contract that you may or may not have is terrible. It's make sure that you get this vetted. Do not trust some of the people in this industry. There are a lot of shady people in this industry. There's a lot of good, hardworking people, but be careful. Protect yourself. You're a hardworking farmer. The last thing you want to do is invest all the money that it takes to grow a crop and then have somebody bail on you when it's time to sell. So protect yourselves and know that there's a risk. It's why you are going to have a hard time getting a loan. You are going to find that it's not as easy to do this as it is to grow any crop. But obviously there's a potential to make a good profit. Um, so given that we are sort of this vertically integrated operation, you know, we actually can do a lot of things to help you all out. We sell clones. Um, we can uh, 
provide you with an testing services because we have a high performance uh, liquid chromatography machine that will analyze to make sure that you have a legal crop that you have that you harvest on time instead of too late when your product could spike with THC if you wait too long. Um, you know, we can also provide extraction services, post-processing services if you do want to create a product. Uh, we can help you with product formulation. Uh, and then obviously market strategy is a big part of what I'm doing. Uh, we can help you figure out uh, who your target market could be for a product if you wanted to come up with an innovative product and sort of assess the possibilities. Um, it's a hyper-competitive marketplace. We were just down in Boston at the New England Cannabis Convention, and there are so many players in this industry globally. You know, we met a farmer from Australia, and uh, we were talking to him, and you know, he's like, yeah, I, own, I manage two farms in Australia. One of them is 22,000 acres, and the other one is 44,000 acres. And, he, and, and I was just looking at him, and I was like, yep, that's a little bit different than Vermont scale, but it, it, it's just to give you a perspective of what's going on, not just in Vermont, not just nationally, but really internationally, there's all sorts of things changing. Uh, Canada is changing their rules. They haven't been able to grow hemp for CBD before. They will be soon. So there's, the industry is going through a lot of change. And so you definitely want to think about um, the future. You know, uh, if you think that this is an opportunity for uh, free, easy money forever, um, check that. That's not the reality. You ask anybody, some folks have made good money, um, but that doesn't mean that it'll always be available, so you really want to think very hard because it's a big investment, and all of y'all work too hard to have your big investments erode away because um, you trusted certain people without making sure that you um, were protected. So I know that our time is pretty much up and we want to have the Farmers Forum, but uh, Certainly, we, have, we can help folks with a lot of questions you have about, you know, from the very beginning process to all the way to the end of actually putting a product on shelves and getting it distributed regionally and nationally. There's a lot of different things here, way too much that we could cover, but hopefully we've at least got you thinking about some of the stuff you need to. Can you answer? Uh, I'm wondering, just, could you just touch on how you actually dry your plants? How you actually dry them? Like, so, oops, sorry. Go ahead. Our process, you mean? What we do? What, yeah. How do you do it? You want me to do that? Yeah, please. So, um, as you saw there, I mean, we hand cut every plant. We hang them um, either in a barn or in a greenhouse that has a black cover over it to keep the sun off. So we dry them slowly. Typically, they don't finish dry in the barn, so they spend some time in the barn and then they move into the greenhouse where the um, moisture and humidity can be controlled better. And I mean, it's like my husband snaps those stems and when they're just where he thinks they need to be, that's when we start stripping them off and, and getting them bagged up. So do you strip the, uh, the branches off of the stem before you try to dry it, or do you dry the whole plant first? Well, it varies. I mean, the first year we did a lot of branch hanging because our plants were monstrous. Um, last year our plants, um, a lot of them came from clones, and I'm not sure if that had some to do with it, and the soil was a little different where we were, but there was a lot less leafy. Um, I, you probably, I mean, if you could tell from season one to season two here, um, he kept a lot more space between the plants in year two, called the bottoms of them more to allow for more air circulation. They were more buddy plants and not as um, leafy. So we were able to hang some whole plants, but um, we typically don't strip it off the stalk until it's dry. What temperature? I've heard liquid nitrogen uh, can freeze it quick. Have you heard anything more on that? We've been hearing a little bit about people that can come in with freeze, you know, freezers and um, freeze your crop for you. I'm not sure how they're going to do that in Vermont with people growing 10 and 20 acres. It's going to take a big freezer to freeze all that. Um, and I don't know, like, the availability of it. Like, if all of you here are growing and the window of harvest is a couple of weeks long, um, and you all need your crop freeze-dried within that window. I, 
My husband can't believe it's possible, but I keep telling him, you know, things are possible, things change, but um, I have, we haven't seen it, so I don't really know. Senator from Essex Orleans. Uh, along with being a grower, I've been making sure that Vermont is staying on the leading edge in hemp. Uh, last year I wrote the language that brought Vermont into federal compliance. This year we're working uh, to tweak that a little bit because of the um, 2018 Farm Bill changed some things. We're trying to stay ahead of it. so. Uh, Vermont can continue to lead the way. We've got tons of people coming here from other states because they know Vermont's out front on our, on our policy and know that we've got a lot of hard workers. I would echo something that's been said before. Uh, be careful. There are, there's a lot of great folks in this industry, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of people they are looking out for themselves uh, and don't really care if, if you end up making any money or not. Uh, it's easy to put a big number on how much an acre is worth or what they're going to pay you. Um, it usually, in the end, comes out a little bit different than what they said by the time you put your fertilizer and your time and, and everything else in. And especially if you plant them too close or have a wet end of the season like last year and lose a bunch of what you've already grown. Uh, to mold or if you don't have a proper drying facility you can hang them up and lose them to mold there as well but we grew about 1500 uh, plants last year we have been making some of our own products just uh, working with a processor just started putting out and bottling our own extract um, so we're doing a couple different things we sell some wholesale to processors but we're also making our our own uh, extracts and other products um, as Karen and Jethro said, there's, there's a lot to it. It's not simple. It's, it's, it's basically a little uh, science experiment. So um, most of the strains out there, if you leave them out too long, they will spike and go over in the THC. Uh, we are in the, in the uh, moving legislation and rules coming from the agency trying to, to deal with that a little bit because uh, we'd like a little bit more flexibility. Most of the good strains, they are, they are um, bulk and their CBD come up at the end of the season. Uh, but with that, the THC sometimes comes up and what we're trying to do is get to a place where we can allow the high CBD strains to be grown um, with maybe a little more THC than is allowed right now. Um, but basically test it uh, taxonomically, uh, so by strain, 
to make sure it's a type 3 cannabis, which where the THC gene has been turned off, and also test it by ratios, where right now, um, as was stated, the, the testing is extremely expensive. And so if you've got 10 acres and you're trying to pull it in at the perfect time before it spikes, you've got to do a lot of testing. At 65 bucks a test, it's going to cost you a tremendous amount of money because this plant right here could be different than that plant right there. So tremendous amount to it. Um, I'll pass it off to Bob, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much of a story we're supposed to tell or, or how, how uh, if we're supposed to take more questions. We're invited here to, to share our experience. And uh, oh, I'll just mention one more thing. Uh, Cam and Karen said they hung a lot of branches, some whole plants. I hung almost all whole plants. Uh, this is my, this will be my third year of growing. Um, the, the main things to remember, don't put them too close, and it's the same with growing. You put them too close, uh, you're going to have more mold, you're going to have more problems. Uh, if you hang them too close, you're going to have more mold, you're going to have more problems. If you have a year, like this past year, where it rains for three weeks, you're going to need heat and you're going to need a lot of air because you can blow all the moist air you want through those things. They don't dry a bit. <laughs> it also takes as much space to dry as it does to grow. So let's yeah. just have Bob and here's something I will start. I'm Bob Butterfield from Brownington, Vermont. Um, my son talk, talked me into this project. <laughs> Two years ago he brought it to me and I kind of laughed at him. Well, last year he came and wanted to do an acre and I'm kind of a hard head like Mr. Debro, <laughs> who's basically right across the valley from me, very close. But um, I told me that we go big or go home. We put, we put in four acres and 3,500 plants our first year. It was an interesting year. Um, we learned a lot. Um, the drying process, like they were saying, is a, is a bottleneck area. Um, security is a big problem, we found. Um, we were kind of naive being first year into this business. We didn't have our drying barn secure with cameras and everything. We had 300 plants stolen out of our barn. Yeah, and we averaged without, we didn't do irrigation, and our soil is a sandy soil, so we had, you know, we, we average, still averaged over a pound of plant without irrigation. Um, we hand fed these plants with um, a pelletized chicken manure. Our soil tests all run well because we do have our land soil tested. Um, and we would, we would hand fertilize when we knew there was some rain coming. And we went through every plant and just hand fertilized them all. And we had, like I said, we started out with 3,200 plants. Um, we did start 900 of our seeds were either or, and we ended up pulling over 400 male plants out of our plantation, which by the time we, being our first year, realized what it was, um, it was late July. So we had a lot of money invested into these plants at that point, and we were just pulling them and throwing them. So, you know, that was another big loss for us. We did lose a bunch to mold in one of our drying barns because we didn't have enough air movement. We got jam-packed, not realizing, like Ben just said, it takes as much space to dry them as it does to grow them. Being first year, we didn't know that. And we filled one barn, and then we had to move to a second one, and we ended up losing a lot of plants in there to mold. So. Yeah, so that'd be one of my recommendations. When you're thinking about how much you're going to grow, Think about first how much roof space you have, how many plants can you dry, and then work backwards. Don't say, this is how much money I want to make, I'm going to grow 20 acres and you've got to build in this size because it's not going to work. Uh, extremely important to have plenty of room. Bob and I both learned last year, uh, I lost, a, not, not bad, but I did have a couple places where the roof was real low, where there wasn't as much air circulation, where I did lose some to mold. And there again, we had more plants than we had roof space. So we were tucking them in closer than they should have been. And uh, so my recommendation is figure out how much drying space you have. And uh, as Heather was going over, you don't need a lot of heat. 
but you do need something that is going to dry the air. So some type of furnace to produce very low level heat. And then the main thing is circulation. Uh, the other thing you want to think about is if you've got a closed space, you want to think about big dehumidifiers. Um, we had just a couple like little household ones and you can't believe how much water those things pulled out of our drying space. Just amazing. So um, drying is important because you don't want to do all that work. You've got all that money into your plant and you can still screw it up when you dry it. If you don't get it dry enough and you put it in a bag, you're going to open that bag and it's going to be mush. You just destroyed your whole season, your whole investment. So as important as picking your seed uh, is, I think it gets more important every step you make in the chain. So pick good strains from reputable people so you know that you're not going to have THC that's too high and you lose your whole crop. Uh, pay attention, walk your fields as often as you can, look for hermaphrodites, look for males, look for sick plants, look for mold, make sure you do a good job drying it. Once it's perfectly dry, make sure you secure it in, in a good uh, quality bag. What is your average dry time? Could you speak up? I'm a little hard of hearing. Your average dry time. Well, last year it took three or four weeks because it rained for three weeks. But if it, it, that, it's, there's so many variables. It uh, depends what you have. If you've got it uh, in, a, in a greenhouse and you don't have dehumidifiers and, and good ventilation, the greenhouse is going to hold all that moisture. If you've got it in a hay barn under a tin roof, uh, which is where mine was last year, and the sun comes out, it gets hot and all you have to do is turn the fans on. It's gonna, it's gonna dry out probably in a week. But it, last year the sun didn't come out for about three weeks and it took forever to get the moisture out of it. And the, key, the critical time is that, is that first few days. The critical time is to, to, that's when they're the moistest. And so to get the drying process started, once you get them to a certain level, they stabilize pretty well. You gotta also remember that you're if you're hanging whole plants, which we did, you got a big stalk. Some of those stalks are going to be this big around. And you got a lot of moisture in that stalk. So if it is humid like it was last fall, it took a lot longer to dry than we expected it would. Um, yep. And we had fans running constantly 24 hours a day, big, big barn fans, all kinds of fans moving air constantly. And it just took a lot longer than we expected it was going to. No, and that's a good point. There's a tremendous amount of moisture in the stock, uh, but from the, uh, the old hippies that I learned how to grow cannabis from, they always said that there was good stuff in those stocks, right? right? So when you hang the whole plant, those, those flowers are still feeding from that stock and drawing that moisture out. And that's why I say it is so critical in those first few days until you get that stock moisture dried out. Um, to have that warm, dry air, the dehumidifiers, and plenty of big fans. You have to keep the air moving. Mold is your enemy. Yes. It's, it's terrible. This question is for all three of you. After that first year, if you could have changed one thing that you did, what would it be? We're, we're, gonna, um, we're going to eight acres this year. Um, we did go six feet apart, and we did not till the whole field. Um, we rode it tilled rows, we made a row, we mowed it right next to it with our lawnmower, and then set over that width and rode it tilled again. Um, we got a reverse turning rototiller that was digging all the time instead of one that's spinning forward. Um, and we worked the bed a lot. Um, we are going to go to plastic on five acres with irrigation this year. And then we're going to do a little experiment um, with the other three acres that we're working out, trying to work out right now, and go to that and see what happens. We did fence in um, our acreage, but we're going to do some without fence this year. The deer did not bother, bother the started plants at all. Our, we put our plants in; they probably were that big. And we again are going to put started plants in. But the only thing we are going to change is we're going to change to some irrigation and some plastic. Well, uh, 
Yeah, I would, I would say that uh, the key with hemp is to make sure you've got your soil tilled good and deep. Uh, especially if you're growing from seed, they have quite a tap root. The more they go down, the more the plant grows. Um, we might try some plastic. I am probably, if I do it, I'm going to use the Bio 360, uh, which is a biodegradable plastic that I talked with the folks that make it, and they said they're hoping by the end of the year it'll be certified organic. It's not yet, but it is made of organic plant-based uh, compounds. Um, I don't like the idea of piling lots of plastic up in the landfill. I don't, you know, I know a lot of people do it. It helps with weeds. Um, we grew a couple different ways. Um, some of the land was tilled all around the plants and it was fine in the beginning and the plants actually got pretty high and above most of the weeds. But towards the end of the season, some of the weeds were getting high enough so that they were crowding the branches, right? And that's where you're gonna get mold. If you don't have good air circulation, if you planted your plants too close together and they're touching, you're gonna to have trouble. If you've got weeds growing up in those branches, you're gonna have trouble. Um, we did some right on our front lawn. We took, I got a uh, two foot uh, three point hitch auger and just drilled holes in the front lawn and put the plants in there with all the amendments. They grew wonderful that way. You, you probably wouldn't want to do uh, five or ten acres that way because it, it, it is more time consuming than tilling a row. But we could mow around those plants with the lawnmower, work slick as heck. No, no weeds, everything was nice and neat. Um, so this year, my plan is to do a uh, strip, something like uh, Bob said, where you, where you leave uh, the hay or grass growing and, for, for a work aisle, basically. That's the other thing you want to think about. You don't want them planted like corn where there's no room to walk in between them either. You got to have the aisle uh, to drive the tractor or the four wheeler or whatever down so you can work on them. Um, but be able to mow. And uh, talking, talking with a, a guy, um, Tom Gilbert, who has black dirt down in Standard, and just talking about different methods of doing it. And he knows more about soil than I do. And he said the less of the turf you upset, the better off uh, all the turf around it is. Because all those microorganisms that are working for your soil, they're safer in there. So if you leave those strips of grass in between, all those organisms are able to come right out and repopulate the, the soil um, in he suggested that it's, it's far healthier for your soil. One, one thing if you're going to mow, we mowed once a week, um, you do not want grass blowing on these plants. Good point. Mulch um, it. Mulch it. We used a zero turn mower and we looked at putting a mulching system on it. It was $1,200 to put a mulching mower on this mower. We're kind of innovative and I'm kind of cheap. <laughs> <laughs> we took the rubber flap off the end of the mower. Went down the hardware store and bought a piece of stove pipe, <laughs> bent it around to fit the mower, and screwed it in, made a perfect mulching mower <laughs> for $17. No, and that's, that Bob makes a good point because if that grass blows onto the lower branches, it wants to start mold. That's where your diseases start. You've got to keep those plants clean. The other thing I'm going to suggest is trimming off the bottom branches. The bottom branches, as Heather was saying, if it's wet, they're going to get splashed with mud. That can start disease. The other thing with that is we harvested with a chainsaw. It was real simple. You could go down through and cut, cut them off, and the guys were stacking them on trailers. When you start, if you don't trim them, we learned you got all these bottom branches. Well, there's buds on them that we wanted to dry, and we were drying a lot of branches. We are going to trim ours, which will also force the feeding to go up and grow bigger buds on the top. Yeah. There's and a certain amount of nutrients coming up that plant. So if you cut off those bottom, bottom branches, my theory anyway, is those nutrients are going to go to the higher branches and make those buds bigger. Generally, your low branches have a small yield anyway. So from my perspective, uh, after two years of growing, I'm going to trim all the bottom branches off mine. Ben, do you want to answer the question about what's the, what you learned yeah, I mean, one of the things I like about doing this is I always learn at all the time. And uh, what I learned last year, uh, one, I'm not going to irrigate. 
I irrigated half my crop on the irrigation system and the other half I didn't. And the crop, the side I irrigated, I got some root diseases, lost some plants, uh, and I think it was because I was giving them too much water. Um, my particular field, I think, holds moisture pretty damn well and I don't need to irrigate. The non-irrigated plants did just fine. And uh, that was last year with it being so dry. We did irrigate by hand when it was in June. We had no rain and the roots weren't established yet, but the roots grow really fast. Um, I've had seedlings where the tap root is this long and the seedling is this tall. Like you see the, the root poking out the bottom of your container already. So the roots grow fast and when they take in, they're, they'll get the water. Um, probably depends on your soil type and stuff, but just in my case. And then the other thing is uh, I had some cover crop growing, some buckwheat on a field that I, I hadn't planted anything in. I just spread cover, uh, buckwheat seed down and that grew really tall. And uh, the rows of hemp that I had next to that molded really bad. Mm -hmm. um, like we lost half of it to mold probably, 50%. Versus that once you got two rows in from there, there was like significantly less mold. So just keeping good airflow everywhere. I, I, my theory, I mean, I, I just think it was because that, that tall buck wheat was like blocking the wind mm -hmm. and not allowing the dew to dry. You know, in the fall, the days are shorter. The mornings are cool. I have a lot of fog that takes a long time to burn off till like 12 or one o'clock. And the plants are wet and the buds are thick, which is awesome, that's what you want, but the mold loves it too and it grows just as fast as your flowers. So it's kind of, a, for me it was a battle with mold last year. Probably lost 25% of my crop to mold, I'm guessing. And uh, I'm gonna try to do more this year to prevent mold from happening in the first place. And, Are you gonna uh, rotate your crop if you had mold? Uh, I'm thinking about that, yeah. I, I, I have some established, my field is not in a, like a long time farm field. I mean, I bought my land four years ago and um, it was an established field but the people didn't really use it for growing anything so the soil wasn't great so I had to amend with a lot of compost. So I, like part of me wants to reuse those holes because there's so much good compost there but you know especially the area that where I had the root diseases and stuff I mean I, I'm not a scientist I don't really know all about the background of these diseases but I try to learn about it as much as I can through my own research and some of them say those root diseases can survive in the soil, so it makes me nervous about replanting there. Maybe that will rotate over you know, to a different spot. To, and I think that's a good point uh, Ben made about the, the mold and the buds. He had big, dense buds. Um, so we had several different strains, and you'll see the different strains grow differently. Our Auto 2 is more leggy, and the flowers are spread out, and that had hardly any mold. And some of the other strains that we grew with the big dense buds close together, they're much more likely to mold. So strain matters. And so uh, there are some strains that you're going to want, as soon as they start showing mold, you're going to want to start harvesting and, and get them in and stabilize them before you lose it. So you're, uh, when you trim the bottom plant, uh, how high up are you going? One or two worlds and branches up? We're going to go about four inches, I, we're thinking, from the bottom. Just four the, inches? Four to five inches okay. off the bottom. Because we had all those limbs and what, what to do with them. And we, we didn't leave them laying in the field. We picked them all, we dried all those small limbs. And we just want to avoid that and we do want to force more of the growth to the top for those bigger buds that are on the top. When were you trimming them? Later in the fall, you were shearing them up? Or were you doing No, we're gonna trim, we're gonna probably start trimming. We're doing a little more no, research on it. basal trimming, were you doing that in the fall or are you doing that after you planted? We're gonna trim them this year around, towards the end of July, middle okay. to the end of July. Later yeah. in the season? Yes, later in the season, when they get a little bigger. Yeah. One thing I'll say about pruning is, uh, you can prune them pretty hard and you'll get it back. Like if you do it early in the season, early July, you can prune them pretty hard and you'll get it back. They'll grow fast enough. You'll, you'll come right back. You know, I've, I've pruned them super hard before. Uh, on, on anything that grows on the inside, you're not gonna get a bud from. So you can really prune it back to like everything except the outside growth when it's a fairly young plant and that thing will explode with growth off the tops. You know, if the root base is there, they'll just, you'll get it all back back 
off the top. So don't worry about it. Prune your plants. What do you guys there's recommend? There's a question in the back. Sorry. So make sure we get this. Okay, okay. Back. Right. Hey, do you guys use, do you have any strategies for supporting the plant? If you got a good strain, you shouldn't need support. You don't, you don't need it. My strategy is don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of work. I mean, I've grown monster plants before, and if you guys have been to my place, if you have, you've seen a couple of my bigger Wait. ones that I start really early, like in February. And uh, that's the reason why they're so big, is because I stick them in June, they're already this tall. But you're better off, I think, in the first week of June with a plant that's this big, because, and well-spaced, because you're not going to have to support it. Caging and staking is extremely labor-intensive. It's not worth the time. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, we'll say one more thing following up on, on Ben's pruning. Uh, make sure you pick up your pruning. If you're just cutting that stuff and leaving it in the field, that's apt to start disease. Get it out of there. Okay. Did they answer your question? Or? No, but okay. Okay. leading up to it, you all have different size operations. <laughs> Give us an idea of your labor force to manage each size of your operation. <laughs> <laughs> we, it was me and my son to start with. Um, come when we planted, we did it in shifts of three people. Um, I would row to till, four or five roll, rows ahead, and we then I started with the plants, and we were taking going six feet apart. Did you have a planter? No, we planted all by hand. We did everything by hand. <laughs> that's what I mean. that's Right down to the pruning was all by the stripping of the stems was all done by hand. Um, I would walk between the rows with a tray of <coughs> seedlings and drop every six feet. And we had two guys, one guy in each row, just planting plants right behind me. We were able to plant the 3,200 plants in a day and a half. Doing it yeah. <laughs> we pushed it. Uh, there was six of us when we harvested, um, going through and getting it all done. And then when we did strip the plants, some days there was 10 of us. And how, how many days? The stripping took us two weeks. Okay. Um, the harvesting <clears throat> took us about a week and a half. Because um, like Ben was saying, you don't want to harvest these plants when they're wet. So your time period in that day gets short when you're harvesting because you've got to get that dew off them. And if you're cutting them down, you don't want the dew on the ground either. Okay. Do yeah, so uh, uh, early on it was it was mostly uh, me and uh, my son and my wife when we all have full-time jobs and that was that's the thing about getting into this so I grew 1500 plants last year but there was no money coming in so I was still running my construction company uh, which I'm gonna be doing for cash flow again this year so <laughs> it's uh, yeah it's a, it's a lot to take on so um, my son started the mothers early on and then we started cloning once we got my grow room up so the two of us were sort of working on it part-time and then once we got stuff in the in the greenhouse in may um that was you know a couple hours i hit a couple hours before i went to work a couple hours after i went to work and then once june hit we we started putting them in basically evenings early morning weekends so it was mostly uh three of us and then when it came to harvesting, we had another three or four people that helped us off and on on no regular schedule. But if it's just uh, you and a, and a couple other people, it's quite a lot to take care of an acre. And what I would tell anybody growing it the first time is you're better off to have one acre and take really good care of it than to try to grow three acres. Because if you've got the time to care for those plants, you can make them two pound plants instead of trying to take care of too many and having half pound plants. Also the, the competition in this industry is such that you, you won't sell bad quality product. Um, you'll just sit on it. So it has to be good quality in order to sell because there's just, there's too much competition. So you'd be better off having an acre of like really high quality flower if that's what you're trying to grow or whatever you're trying to do rather than like three acres of really poor quality because nobody's going to want to buy it as far as, at least in my experience. But so that leads to a question. I know there's some, some growers that are uh, contracting to grow it and then it's harvested and taken somewhere else to dry. It sounds like there's a lot that can happen between harvesting and drying. Is there some way they can test as that's leaving the field 
so that they know that so they're they're really at the mercy of whoever's drawing. Absolutely, right. and that's and that's one of the thing I, things I'm worried about with those contracts is once that leaves, um, they're going to tell you how much they got out of it, and there's no way for you to really know. I mean, I think you can have an idea, but but they can tell you anything, and what recourse are you going to have? And, and that is one of my concerns. I looked at one of those contracts and met with one of those guys, and I told him straight up, I said, "There's no way I would sign that contract." Drying is like is probably the most critical part of the process, in my opinion, just because you have so much invested at that point, and you already harvested it all, so you need to dry it properly. I mean, if you lost, if you had mold, if your stuff molds on you while you're trying to dry it, it's just devastating. I mean, you've lost your entire, everything you've been working on since March, you've lost it. All your time, everything. So, you really, drying it is like super important. Yeah, just one more thing. If it, if it actually works out and the guys that are signing those kind of contracts come through, it's a huge burden gone. If they're actually paying you for what you're producing and, and giving you a fair deal, it's a huge burden off you to get it out of there. All you have to do is grow it, and like Ben just said, it's the critical time and it's somebody else is doing it. I'm not sure if some of these people who say they'll do that understand what they're getting into. I don't know. I mean. Maybe they've dried hundreds of acres before. I mean, I've heard all these rumors myself. I hear all the rumors and people who are, you can grow it and they'll dry it for you and all that, but I'm not sure. What I would ask them, and what I do ask them when I talk to them is, how are you gonna dry it? How much have you dried before? And what's your strategy? I mean, because the, the harvest window is short. It's like a seven day window, maybe 10 at the most, especially up here, because they can handle a frost, like a light frost. No problem, but then once it turns and we get those heavy frosts day after night after night, they're just, then they rot real quick. Yep. I had plants go right into the snow, so that, there again, it depends on what strain you had. Yeah. I have pictures of mine just completely covered with snow, and very few of them uh, did it affect. But the guy I talked to that was offering the drying service has a, a giant belt dryer that'll do 2,000 pounds an hour. So that's the way some of them are doing it. They also have a giant freezer. They're going to freeze some of it, and there's all this new technology coming along. Somebody mentioned the liquid nitrogen. I just heard of another process, and I'm not sure if it's nitrogen, but it somehow stabilizes it, and they like backpack it in, in some sort of bag, and it's supposed to be good for 18 months. So, so there is innovation coming along, but I'm still wary about everybody until they've proven themselves. Do you really get paid the money that everybody's bragging about? Nobody knows yet. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. These guys haven't proven themselves. This guy in the back has yeah. had a question for a while here. So I'm just kind of curious, and you guys <clears throat> talked a little bit about um, I'm one of those guys who might sign one of these contracts or has signed sign the contract. I guess I'm just concerned about the, the reality of uh, how fast we can harvest it. I mean, so we're, we're supposed to be able to go out there and prune these trees and uh, theoretically with a group of 20 guys uh, harvest uh, five acres a day and I'm, I'm it's a lot of work that's all I got to say it's, it's, it's like they're just like Christmas trees so I don't know if you've ever harvested so, so, Christmas so when trees I say that, then then the next concern is, is the turn time as you guys talk about this mold it, let's assume it's a clean crop how much time is it going to take from the time I pick it to 12 hours later, if it's in a bag, it's going to start to ferment. Absolutely, exactly. and that's another one of my concerns. It's just like hay. If you put in wet hay and compress it, you're going to make heat, you're going to make mold, you're going to lose product. Yep. As far as how long it took us to harvest 340 plants, half an acre, we, because we had mold, we uh, visually inspected each each plant and we were cutting mold out and throwing it away as we were harvesting. And it took me and my partner who's, I mean, I, I like to consider myself a hard worker. I know there's a lot of hard workers here. And my partner, Ernie, is like one of the hardest workers I know. He's a little faster than I am. And it took us 10 days, I think, 10, 12 hour days. And uh, we also had people helping us. Sarah helped us and we had you know, help four or five other people on some certain days, like weekend days. Me and Ernie just went 10 days straight, but other people would help us, thankfully, and it took us that much time. I mean, we got rid of most of the mold, 
But then we did have some come back in the barn. We hung it in the hayloft, and we had mold come back in there. After we spent that much time, we were like, God. I grew up on a dairy farm and went into stone masonry, and it's the hardest I've ever worked in my life. Wow. <laughs> Don't let anybody fool you that it's, it's an easy job. It really is not. We walked our plants every day, and like they were saying, the more you take care of them, the better you do. Um, we mowed once a week. Somebody was walking them every day, um, checking them. I know Frank and Janet, they came up to see it a few times to see what we were doing. We did have plants, even at six feet, um, that were in the high moisture areas. They did touch the, touch some, but we didn't get any mold in the field. We got it in the heart, in the drying barn because of jammed in spaces and not enough air movement. So how about in the back there? Yeah, uh, clones. Uh that come off the female plant, uh, do they grow as big and as well as the mother plant is? They, they, they grow they grow plenty big and plenty well if you take care of them. The difference is they don't have a tap root. So a lot of people will tell you a seed will grow a bigger plant and generally I think they're right, but I wouldn't be one I actually grew some clones. I started late last year and I had clones that went over two pounds. The biggest plants I've ever grown were clones. But they were started early. The biggest difference is when they're started. That's sure. that's all the difference. Yeah. Did you, either of you, any of you, you use feminized seeds at all? All, oh, I should say all. We had 900 seeds that were not feminized. All the rest were feminized. This year we bought all feminized seeds. This will be my first year with feminized seed. I've never done feminized seed. Before. I call I call the males before they go in the ground. I there's. It's, I mean, it sucks, it's hard to do, but you can see, you can look between where the branch goes out, there's a little tiny thing there, and there's either a couple of ball, yep. pair of balls or a big old fat titties. Any of the males recommend anybody who doesn't have experience it I wish I remembered the name of the book but there's a there's a cannabis encyclopedia uh, has tremendous amounts of uh, information it's a, it's like a purple cover on it but it'll tell you how to pre-sex and basically what Ben was saying is in about seven or eight weeks a few branches down they will show and you've got to have good eyes my son is way better at doing it than I am um, but they'll either show a little hair or two, or they'll show a couple little pollen sacks. Yeah. We, uh, we, were, we were lucky enough that um, my, son, my son is the head of all the valet and Belmont at uh, Stowe Mountain Resort. And he's got a guy that works underneath him that grew marijuana in California um, on one of the big farms out there. And he came to work for us last summer, and his experience and what he knew really benefited us on our first year, as well as sexing as anything. Yeah. Has anybody tried growing or planting them using a Christmas tree planter, and does that work? I would say probably not, because it probably doesn't loosen up enough soil. Um, I'm not exactly sure what a Christmas tree planter is. The only ones I've ever seen are the ones you stick in the ground by hand and make a little space. And they hook on the back of a tractor. Yeah. And you guys got a little, one hand. little single plow and splits it. What, I, what I'm going to tell you is that plant, the size of it, is going to directly relate to how much loose soil there is under it. If you loosen up this much soil, your plant's going to be this big. If you loosen up this much soil, your plant's going to be this big. I wrote it till it was 42 inches. How many inches? 42 10 inches wide. Right. That's ours. Is. Deep, the deep, you can't go too deep. My best plants grew in soil that I took my excavator with a uh, screen bucket and I went two feet deep. <laughs> I shook all the rocks and debris Jeez. out. I mixed chicken manure and wood ash in and I'm telling you, those things planted late were still over two pounds. So that's why I'm saying the more soil you can loosen up, the better you are. We used a 16 inch auger. So maybe. Wait, I want to hear what you use an auger, you say? Uh, we used a 16 inch auger on the back of the tractor. In the, in the bucket, we had compost. And one guy in the front shoveled out seven scoops of compost and then drove over it with the tractor and drilled it in. 
and just kept marching down that way. And the spacing ended up being eight feet apart because when you, when the guy in the tractor drove his ass right over where the compost had been, your drill was right where the last pile was. So we just, that's how we set our spacing, and which you could go closer than that. Sure. I did some that way too, and that's an excellent way to do it with a big auger. If you've got stony ground though, get a big box of shear pins. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thanks uh, guys for coming in. administrative rules, ICAR. Uh, and so the next step in the process is it gets filed with the Secretary of State's office after we have our initial meeting with ICAR. Then it begins the public process. We will take public comments from everybody on the rule. The rule primarily addresses registration. I wrote it down. Registration. I, you'd think I'd know this, because um, I've been doing this for six months. <laughs> uh, registration, record keeping, testing, labeling. We are hoping to establish a Vermont brand for hemp that is produced in our state to set ourselves apart from other states who can d definitely beat us on the quantity of hemp that they can grow. But just like cheese, beer, and maple syrup, we have quality products in our state. So our goal is the rules will support the industry and hold everybody to specific expectations so that we can all succeed in this industry. Um, so it's been filed and now it's like, it's, well, it's, there's, there are certain deadlines where things have to happen. Um, is it like by the July 1st kind of thing? Like, no, the there is no, no date was set by the legislature when they asked the agency to go through rulemaking. So there's no uh, date by which the agency has to have rules in place. Um, but I can say that the goal is that the rules will be in place uh, in order to be um, a part of the state plan that gets submitted to USDA for approval that enables the state of Vermont to be the primary regulatory authority of the hemp industry within its within the state, rather than USDA. So we're looking to do that locally within the state. Um, and USDA is adopting rules, uh, hopefully they say by the fall of this year, which will be in place for 2020 um, for the rest of the nation. And they've asked that states not submit their plans until they have adopted their rules. So. We're hoping, people say it's like five months from when you begin the process, so I'm going to estimate that from this point, which isn't ideal. I understand we're about to go into a growing season and we're going to be taking public comment and holding public meetings across the state while you all are working in the field. Um, but you will be able to submit written comments. We're going to have a web page. Um, so we really appreciate your feedback. So I'm going to cut to the chase and just talk about registering. <laughs> which is really dry, and I apologize. Um, but in order to register, I'm going to suggest that you don't do a Google search, because we've changed our website uh, recently. And if you do a Google search for Vermont Agency of Agriculture Hemp, you're going to be taken to a place that says page no longer exists. So go to the agency's primary website. And then if you click on the second dot, I don't know if you can see the little hand, um, it's going to bring you to the hemp program. And then you can go that way. It's also found, 
um, in the public health and ag resource management uh, page. But you, you'll see it. There's hemp plants. So just obviously look for the hemp plants. So I'm going to actually click there, and then it'll say hemp program. That brings you to this page, registration. It's the bureaucratic white paper right there. You're going to click on that, and then you're going to read about how you register, because it's important to read what's required of you prior to beginning the process, because we do require some specific information from you in order to register with us. If we do not get the information that is required, then it prolongs the process for you. Um, so, you read all this, go further down, get some, there's some pictures, there's guidance. One of the things we need, or actually, Two of the most important things we need are maps of your location of where you're going to cultivate hemp. So this is for growers. There's growers and processors, separate application forms. If you're going to process, you need to fill out an application form. That is a little bit more simple. The grower's application requires the map. Um, the map must contain your name, your business name if applicable, the address of the parcel that is pictured in the image, and the boundaries of where you intend to grow. We need all that information. Now I know that sounds, you know, it's a lot of information, it's very specific information, but it's actually required by federal law as well um, in the future. When we have our state plan submitted, um, one of the things that the 2018 Farm Bill is requiring of us is for us to have the legal description of the land where people intend to grow hemp. We're not actually, we're hoping that we don't, we will never be collecting deeds from people because that seems not quite informative, but a nice visual map with the boundaries of where you intend to cultivate hemp, as well as the other thing we need are the Latin longitude of the point at which we would enter the property where the hemp will be cultivated. So that's the intersection of the highway, the public road, public right of way, and your driveway or your field entrance. That point right there, we need that latitude and longitude. Um, that has to be on the application form. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the map, but they need to match up. Because what we do at the agency is we look at your map, we look at your Latin longitude points that you've provided to us, and we ensure that it takes us to where you said you were going to plant. <laughs> so we're, we're certifying the sites. Um, is that going to be public information again, like it was last year? I heard some people complain that it was sort of like putting up a target for so. So currently, the information we collect is public. There's not a, um, there's no exemption for the maps from public records law. I believe, is Senator Rogers still here? No, he left. He left. I believe there is a um, proposal in S58, Senate Bill 58, which he um, had put together uh, to make some of that information um, protected from public records requests. <coughs> We are not posting that information on our website, which what was posted last year. But if we get a request, because it's public information, we are sharing the names, the business addresses, and the email addresses, uh, and the individual names, as well as business names, um, in a registry if we get asked, because it's a public record. Um, so yes, right at this point, all, most of it is, except for um, in the application form, which I'm not actually going to go through because that would be really boring. Um, there are some requests regarding um, like information about your business, like how many people are you going to employ, what kinds of um, cultivars are you going to plant, where are you going to get your seeds, are you going to get clones, blah, 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 that kind of information. But we're, we, we believe that that information is protected under a section of Vermont law in Title VI because it's related to business planning. And that's not actually the word, but um, it's related to um, business uh, stuff. So it's protected. <laughs> and, and that actually, and that information in the application form is not required. I mean, well, you have to give us your, your age because we are collecting similar information that the um, National Ag Statistics Service does, which is an age because we're curious about the ages of people who are entering into this, um, into this field. But we would report that information in aggregate. We would never share it individually for anyone uh, in particular. Um, but the cultivars that you plant, like, again, that information may be shared in aggregate, but wouldn't be attributed to any individual who had registered with the agency. Um, so, 
I'm now, let's see here, don't do a Google search, navigate within the agency's web page. Oh, we are no longer requiring you to, if you've gone through this process before, <coughs> to upload the map. We were experiencing difficulties with the online platform that we were using um, in that the size of the maps were too big and people were having crashing problems. Um, so we've eliminated that requirement, but you will be required to submit a hard copy of your map with your check um, when you send that information, that uh, check to the agency. So that's how we're collecting the map at this point in time. Um, if you don't know where you're, well, if you know where you're growing and you've already registered and then you discover that that soil's very rocky and you want to move it to, a, or it's a wetland, and you want to move it to another location, if you've already registered your site and you've received your registration, you will have to register again. We do not have the ability to amend the location of your field. The cost is $25, that just about costs the, covers the cost of us doing the work and the certification of the field. Um, so you would have to register again and go through the process and provide that information again. But you can, if you know where you're growing and you want to grow in multiple fields in three different towns, you can register all of that with one registration if you know in advance. You don't have to submit separate ones. If you're processing, this is a different distinction, um, you have to register each individual site separately um, from processing. Growing, I'm going to take a step back. Um, growing includes obviously cultivating, planting. Um, if you're selling seedlings, like when you're in possession of live plant material or harvested, plant, uh, harvested material, uh, and it includes drying and storing. So that can all be covered by a grower's registration. And we want to know where you're storing, too, if, you're, if that's part of your grower permit. You're going to do it in a barn across the street from your field. You need to locate that for us. Yes? What if you don't know? What if you don't have all that information yet? For instance, if you're going to hire, you're going to outsource the drying. OK, so that gets to my next point. If you are outsourcing the drying, then it's not your issue. But the person who is drying for you must register as a processor because they are engaged in a commercial activity and are taking, in, taking possession of other people's cultivated crops. So that's a processor, and they get to register. You don't have to worry about it. If you get your crop back, I, at, at some point in the future, you've registered your locations or wherever you're storing it, and you're set to go. Or I'm, I'm trying to think of an instance where you would get plant material back after it was dry, but I suppose there are instances. Um, Okay, so that's the difference between growing and processing. Processing also includes, for those of you that want to do lipid extractions or CO2 extractions, um, or formulation from isolates that you've purchased from somebody else, those, that's all processing. So for instance, you want to make, you have maple syrup, you want to add CBD isolate to it, and you want to market that, you need to register as a processor. Does that make sense? Good. Head's nodding. All right. Um, all righty, so I talked about all my points about registering and a little bit about mapping. Now I'm going to... Um, Can I ask you a registration question? Yes. If, if you get a couple of mother plants and start cloning your own, do you have to get a nursery license if you're not going to sell them to anybody else? Just for if you're not selling clones, you do not need a nursery license. The so nursery you license, you can do it yourself. A nursery lines, license is required if you're selling live plant material. And I noticed on the application, you ask where you bought your plants from. So next year, if I clone my own, and I say, I yeah, grew my own. Yours, yeah, you know, that's fine, yeah. You have, you have to apply every year? This is an annual registration, um, and, I, and I was, it hardened me to hear that everybody's like, oh, and you don't want to just continually grow this in one location, because you could, you know, just carry disease over year to year, the soils might get depleted or whatever. Um, so it's good to know that we have an annual registration because you're going to be moving your field around. <laughs> so you have to just, you have to locate it every year for us. The fees are going up. Um, so they're going to be more than $25. Ooh, uh, Boo, I know. Um, it's a tiered, it's tiered for entry. If it's a fiber crop or a seed crop um, or a building material crop, it's $100 regardless of how many acres you grow. <coughs> if it is a CBD crop, then it is tiered. I don't remember. I have yeah. the fees here. Well, I'm not going to look them up. One to nine acres is $500. There's like a half acre. Yeah. Then, 
Yeah, so there's like four tiers. Over 50 acres is the most expensive. It's $3,000 for the most expensive. Yeah, so it goes and up to $3,000. more is going to 1000 Yeah. But I do have them here, so if you're interested, I'd be happy to share them with you. I have the um, the bill, S58. Next, next, next year's license. Next year, not this year. So it begins 2020. Um, part of the 2018 Farm Bill requires that whatever state is seeking delegation or submits a state plan, they have to prove that they have the resources in order to execute the plan. And currently we have, we, we have $25 a permit. It's not quite enough to actually execute um, a sufficient program for the, for the state of Vermont. So mm -hmm. the fees are going up. They are, they are somewhat, they are on par generally with fees across the state. Um, if you're growing for personal use, um, I'm not sure if it's, it's this crowd particularly, but you do still have to register in order to be covered by the agency's program. Um, otherwise, you're not cultivating, you might be cultivating hemp, but you're not cultivating hemp under the agency's program. <laughs> Uh, all right, so just quickly, this is, I have a lot of Google Maps. There's, um, there's guidance on our webpage for how to get Latin longitude and how to create maps. Um, but I'm just going to just kind of run through some real quick tips on how to do it. You will need the internet, um, and, you know, but libraries certainly have internets and uh, access to a printer um, to do this really quickly and easily. So Google Maps, this is the Agency of Agriculture. That's State Street in front. I don't have, I, well, maybe we can move up, we can move a little north. Oh, I'm going to cancel. I'm sorry. I know what I'm doing. Cancel out here. You can grow some hemp on the state house lawn. Um, so this is the state house lawn. There's Are the they registered? Place. They're not registered. There it is. There, I get a little contact. Um, well, we've been, we're going to move out a little bit. We're going to call our access right here at the bottom. But so this is just your regular Google Maps. You can do a right click at the intersection of State Street and um, and uh, the, the walkway there. So right click, you know, when you're on your mouse, it's the right click. If it's a Mac computer, I actually have no idea how to do a right click. So I apologize for those who are Mac users. Um, but the third item down in this list, it says, what's here? Can you guys see that a little bit? <laughs> Um, if you click on that, it's going to bring up the Latin longitude at the bottom of the page. It's this little box right here at the bottom. If you click on that, it then populates it on the left-hand side. And it provides it in both um, decimal degrees, minutes, seconds, as well as just decimal degrees. I may have said those wrong. The one without the degree symbol is just with a decimal point with like five numbers after it. It's much easier to enter than it is to enter the other ones. So that's why we are suggesting that people use that format for the Latin longitude. However, it is not required. We're not sticklers on it. We can convert it if we need to at the agency. Um, and so, so that's how you get it. It's fairly simple. Um, and then to create the map, if you do another right click within the same image and you go to print, it actually creates the map. This doesn't give you the boundaries. But it creates the image that you've got there. It's got your little point that you need. And it has the Latin lounge at the top there. And it gives you an opportunity to type in information, which is your name. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> your business name. The address of the parcel that's pictured in the image where your field is, um, including the town and the zip, like the, the whole address. If I understand that some fields don't have addresses, then please give us the town, the road name and the town that the parcel is located in. Um, and then what you do after that, so Stephanie, whoop, that didn't work. Um, you just type, you type that information. I don't have to show you. But, um, and then you can hit print in the top uh, right hand corner if you have a printer. You print it off, then you grab a pen and you just draw a boundary line around your field and you're done and you send that in to the agency along with your check. Um, so it's fairly simple. There are uh, other platforms were mentioned earlier today. We have directions for the a the r Atlas. We have directions to use um, Google Earth Pro. I have directions to do, to, to keep this in an electronic format if you wanted to and to draw lines, you know, importing it into Word and then doing shapes, yada, yada. Um, but it's easier probably just to use a pen. 
since you're going to send it what in a hard copy. What if you don't use a way. computer? You will have to work with someone. <laughs> um, you can't get around. Yeah. We're limited on time. I know. So I'm going to end. I'm going to end here. Um, I have one more thing I want to say. There was a lot of mention about other permits. Um, stream alter, well, it wasn't stream alteration, but um, Patrick Ross with the Agency of Natural Resources and the Wetlands Division. There is a permit specialist that can help you navigate what permits you may need in order to execute your business. Farming primarily is covered by the agency, but if you're going to disturb wetlands, if you're going to do draws on streams, other permits may be necessary. If you're going to build buildings, you may need some kind of approval. It depends on what you're doing. So I encourage you to contact the regional permit specialist to get information. They cover the, the, uh, all of the state of Vermont agencies and what kind of permits might be needed. Um, and it's hopefully your one-stop shop. Of course, you can contact the Agency of Agriculture, and we can try to help facilitate. Um, but there are multiple agencies within state government, and you may have to reach out to more than one. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. You guys, I want to just keep, keep it rolling here because it's been a kind of a long afternoon. Um, a lot of great information. Thanks for sticking with me. I'm going to try to wrap up uh, by 4:20 or so. Um, so my name is Andrew Sutton. Uh, I'm with Vermont Cannabis Solutions. We are uh, the only designated cannabis law firm in Vermont right now. Uh, we opened our doors in August of last year. And we have uh, just over 70 clients right now, everybody in hemp and CBD. We have farmers, we have people doing extraction, we have people making and selling edibles, um, and we have people doing various combinations of all those things. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that we are there for, we're there for, yes, to answer a lot of legal questions in this area, which there are a lot. There's a lot of gray areas, there's a lot of uh, legal uncertainties, and we're here for the answer to those questions. We're, we're trying to stay on top of this every day. Uh, we're also trying to network, and so if you guys are primarily in this room, I think, are farmers, um, we're trying to put you in touch with an extractor if you need that. If you're going to do your own extraction and you wind up with oil, we want to put you in touch with somebody who's making out of it, so you have a, a place to sell your, uh, your oil. Um, so this is a very complicated area of law, a very interesting area of law, a uh, great opportunity. And I've been asked to speak just for about 15 minutes on how you guys as farmers can protect yourself uh, legally um, as you start to get into uh, this industry. So just to start with the law really quickly, um, we've been talking about growing hemp. And it's been mentioned already, it's 0.3% uh, THC or less. Um, so that's the law. If you are over 0.3%, your that, that crop is uh, in violation of federal law. It's 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 uh, marijuana. It's a controlled substance. And so, if your plants get if your if your crop gets over 0.3, um, you've got a you've got an economic problem, which is that the crop is perhaps no longer economically viable. You've got a legal problem, which is it's illegal for you to possess that. And you're jeopardizing your land under federal law. Yeah, that, that land would become subject to seizure under federal law at that point. Um, so the, the answer to that, and how do you protect yourself to stay legal by growing hemp, is testing. And it's been mentioned uh, a bunch of times before. You got to test. You're gonna, you know, investing in your own in-house testing, or if you have neighbors, maybe you can form a little co-op, and you're going to go in on on some. It doesn't have to be a hugely expensive thing, and they're, every day they're, the, the innovation is incredible. But you have to have some way to make sure that your plants are legal, and that means under 0.3. And that means that when they're this tall and when they're this tall, um, and I'm not a farmer, uh, and I'm not an experienced cannabis grower, but I know that in the, towards the end of the growth of the plant, there's a real spike in THC. And for you guys, you got to harvest before the THC spikes, because that THC is, is a potential to cause, again, legal issues and also economic issues. People are going to want to see the lab results, and if they're hot, they're not going to purchase uh, your crop. So testing, testing. 
uh, I think it was mentioned by Heather uh, Darby from, from UVM, how important testing is of the soil. The, the only other thing I would mention with regard to that is heavy metals. Um, again, I'm not a, a, a plant scientist like we've heard from all afternoon, but the cannabis plant is very good at extracting things from the soil, including heavy metals. Those things will be tested for, and again, no one's going to buy your crop if it's got heavy metals in it. So that's a thing where you know you should test your soil before you put seeds in the ground. And if you have heavy metals in your soil, you got to grow somewhere else. That stuff will be in your hemp and will be in your cannabis. Again, to protect yourself, legally test test it. Um, so that's kind of the law. You know, there's I could go on for an hour alone about interstate shipment of CBD, regulation of CBD by the FDA, whether CBD can go into food products, the difference between interstate shipment of hemp flour and products containing CBD. We don't have time for all that right now. It's, it's, very, it's very complicated and changing day by day. And we're awaiting, you know, we got last night the regulations from the Vermont Department of Agriculture we're awaiting regulations from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the big one we're waiting for is the Food and Drug Administration. Um, so, how can you guys protect yourself? One, the next thing I want to talk about is corporate formation. Okay, you don't want most people like you have an existing farm, you have an existing business, you have a home, um, you have assets. You don't want your cannabis business uh, to interfere with the other assets that you have. So please, form a separate company, form a separate LLC to handle all your cannabis business. Um, that's a limited, li limited liability corporation is what it, you know, sort of is what it says it is. It's gonna limit your liability and it's gonna prevent, if there's any lawsuit, if anything goes wrong, if somebody's injured on your farm, if there's a, if there's a lawsuit over your plants were hot and you were had contracted to, to sell hemp, Whatever, it's good. if there's any legal issues, that's gonna prevent this person from getting at your personal assets. Absolutely vital. Secondly, um, we're encouraging all our, I'll take some questions at the end, let me just get through, I'll, I'll be really quick. Um, we are encouraging all our clients to get a separate bank account, absolutely, for their cannabis, uh, cannabis derived proceeds. That's, that's just basic business there's tax consequences again we don't necessarily have to get into that people who want to start growing uh, THC eventually when that becomes a possibility there's very serious uh, federal tax consequences from being involved in cultivating THC but even for hemp and CBD we want to see people getting a separate bank account that keeps their cannabis funds separate from their other funds that means there's still some issues on the national level banking that's going to mean probably a state chartered bank uh, or credit union, probably a credit union. We're sending a lot of our clients to the Vermont State Employees Credit Union. North Country Federal Credit Union is, is doing cannabis banking now. I just heard that North Country too is, is, is willing to make small business loans to, uh, to cannabis businesses. And so that's a, that's a first. And that's, I'd have to say that's kind of a rumor. I haven't known that that's, that's happening. Um, Again, when you register the, your LLC, you're going to get an employee identification number. That's the social security number for your business. You're going to need that. For any of these, if you're planning on selling any products online, for example, and we heard um, from Northeast Kingdom had the, the problems with payment processing that they've had and banking. Um, those are problems that we're working on every day, and there are payment processing solutions out there. But it's a bit of a whack-a-mole situation where a payment processor will take a cannabis account one day and the next day they won't. Um, so that's a kind of an ever-shifting thing. But you've got to have a, this is another reason to have a corporation and not be trying to do this as an individual so that you have an employee identification number, you have a, corp, you have a business bank account. Oh, okay. So corporate formation, you're going to form a corporation for your cannabis business. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is contracts, okay? And as the industry develops, um, you know, last summer we saw a lot of handshake deals. And we saw uh, sort of handshake deals that got more and more complicated as, as the season progressed. 
So in the beginning, it was like, well, I'm going to give you the starts, and you're going to grow them, and I'm going to get, you know, 10%. Well, half the starts died, and the guy didn't grow them right. And these are all the handshake deals. Okay, well, now I'll, I'll come, and I'll do my labor. I'm going to tend the plants, because you're not doing it right. Now this guy's got hours of labor, and the whole deal is so complicated and impossible to enforce. It was never written down. These guys, can't, a lot of times, can't even remember what they said in, in April. And now it's October, and everybody's mad at each other, and nothing is what it should be. So contracts, okay, you're going to write it down. Even if, uh, look, it's my brother's farm, and I'm going to grow the hemp, and it's my brother. I, I don't care if it's your brother or if it's your wife or whatever. You're going to have a contract or a lease. It's not anything nasty. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it doesn't have to be a conflict. It doesn't have to be hostile. The point of it is, we have an agreement. We're going to write it down. So months from now, we can remember what we agreed on. So I've been doing a lot of these contracts for landowners who have an interest in hemp farming to some extent and varying degrees of wanting to get involved. Okay. So we see people who are like. I own the land, I'm doing an acre or I'm doing two acres, I know how to farm, I'm going for it. And I'm going to, at the end, I'm going to harvest the crop and I'm going to hope for the best. Um, that's viable, by the way, I think that's a good plan, like that can, that can be a very viable plan. And we're there at the end, if you're stuck with your harvest and don't know what to do with it, that's what we're there for too, to help you find a place to sell it. That's one extreme, the other end of the spectrum is, this is my land. You're going to come in, you're going to bring starts, you're going to bring a crew, they're going to grow this crop, they're going to come in at the end and wet harvest it and weigh it in the field and pay me by the pound on a wet weight for my farmland, 10 bucks a pound. That's the other end of the extreme. You're not going to do anything except watch your field grow and watch these guys come and work your field and, and take $10 a pound. Um, so. Whichever, you know, whatever, we've, we've worked out, we've written all these deals. Um, but all these <clears throat> deals have something in common, what you want to think about when you're, you know, the best thing to do is ask a lawyer to review a contract or a, a, a lease for, for land, okay? It should, be pro, it should be reviewed by a lawyer, especially in the cannabis area where you're going to be growing a crop that could potentially be illegal under federal law and could subject this land to federal seizure. So when, when we write these leases, we want to see three, see the lease kind of divided into three sections. One is the land. How many acres? Where is it? How much is the rent? Um, and again, that can be based on a lot of different things. It could be based on a percentage of the yield. It could be based on a straight so many dollars per acre. Uh, we're seeing people do everything. But the land is going to be one part of the lease. The next thing is going to be water and electric. Where is the water coming from? The farmer needs to have the right to use water if he's, if he's leasing the land or has to pay for the water or something. But water has to be addressed in the lease. Then the last thing is the structures. Uh, are there structures included in this lease? Are you renting uh, to the farmer your barn or not? And if you are renting your farm, uh, renting your barn, is there an additional rent for the structure? And when are they going to need it? And when will they have that crop dry and out of there? Um, we just encourage all this stuff to be written down. Um, and then lastly, okay, so we've got, you're going to be aware of the law and you're going to test your crop. That's number one. Number two, you're going to form a cannabis corporation to, to do all your cannabis business with its own bank account. Number three, the contracts are going to be written down, your leases and your deals with whoever. Number four is security. And uh, we saw the signs they have at the UVM field um, about this is not happening. That's a good idea. Um, you know, we encourage reaching out to local law enforcement to tell them, I'm growing hemp, it's not marijuana. And by the way, if some kids steal some of my plants, I expect, you know, we're going to expect law enforcement to respond to them. And we had some mixed results with that last season. Um, and I think really those are, you know, those are the points I wanted to make. I try to get through it quickly. I, I would just like to say one other thing. Um, we are, our office is in Burlington. I left a bunch of cards in the back and, and I brought some folders. I, I don't know if there's any of those left. Um, we are there all the time to answer your questions and to answer your legal questions. So please call us. That's, that's what we're there for. 
And secondly, um, we host a luncheon the first Wednesday of every month from 12 to 2. So the next one is May 1st. I know we're a long way from Burlington, but if you're in Burlington on the first Wednesday of the month, please come by our office. We provide food and um, a speaker usually, and always uh, a group of 20 or 30, and, and the number keeps growing every month, of people in the cannabis industry. Uh, farmers and extractors and, and uh, retailers, and um, it's a place to meet the industry and, and, and just network and talk to people that are, that are doing what you guys are trying to do. So if you're all invited, please, to, to come to one of our luncheons. Um, and if there's any questions, Yeah. This, to touch on what you said about letting law enforcement, we went both to the state troopers and the sheriff's department and let them know what we were growing, where we were growing it. And when we got robbed, when we got robbed it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. They didn't even want to have anything to do with the fact that these plants were taken from us. Yeah, this, we, we, we had clients experience that last, last summer, and we also had other law enforcement agencies that were very responsive and, and treated it like any other type of theft. Um, you know, regarding your own uh, efforts at uh, self-defense or self-protection, um, I would just state that, you know, weapons combined with cannabis uh, is is not a, is not a good idea. Fire, <laughs> <laughs> fire, fire, firearms and cannabis don't mix, right? So just don't do it. it. Like let them steal the plants. Honestly, let them take it. It's not worth it. Aside from that, you know, like we had people using paintball guns and 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 pepper spray. It's like fine, okay, that's better. But <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, you're getting yourself into serious, you know, potentially federal criminal issues if you're defending your cannabis crop with firearms. So we advise against that. <laughs> what are you recommending if the THC is over? Okay, if the THC is over the limit, um, you know, there, it depends, it kind of depends how far over the limit it is. Um, if it's a little bit over the limit, there's, there's things that can be done in terms of uh, creative blending with, le with a lower content THC. If it's close, you might be able to grind it into an extractable biomass that has that will that will satisfy the test. Um, I believe you know uh, you mentioned the new hemp rules that came down last night, and I haven't had a chance to read them, but I imagine there's something in there about what you're supposed to do with your with your hot crop. Um, and one thing you can do is um, have that THC extracted and sell that THC to a dispensary who's licensed to sell it. So. If your crop's a little bit hot, um, there's ways to there's ways to deal with that. If your crop is super hot, I mean, if it comes to be you know eight or nine percent THC, uh, you may be having to destroy that destroy that crop. So we actually have to end it here. Sorry, we're going to be out of this space, but thank you for coming. And please don't forget to give me your survey.